Okay, welcome to our board meeting of June 13th, 2023. The time is 4.02 p.m. Uh, roll call vote, Rosie. Trustee Henderson. Here. Trustee Crane. Here. Trustee Wigan. Here. Trustee Pearson. Here. Trustee Murphy. Here. Trustee Ursoilu. Here. Trustee Bartow. Dr. Smith. Here. Okay. For the adoption of the agenda, we have one amendment to the agenda as posted uh, under item 21B15. We will not be hearing the item on student number 222977 today. Okay, do I have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? So moved. Second. Okay, moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Pearson. Roll call vote. Oh, it was late. Yeah. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Yes. Trustee Bartow? Did I miss here? Was that Ursulu? Amendment. It was Ursulu, <laughs> Trustee Ursulu, not Pearson, who seconded the motion. Mm. All right. And Rosie, do we have any comment cards? Okay. We will begin closed session in a few minutes. The agenda items we will be discussing are 4A, student discipline, two cases. 4B, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, one potential case. 4C, complaint concerning employee 202305 HR. 4D, employee discipline, public employee discipline dismissal, release employment for number 202308 HR. 4E, conference with labor negotiator. And 4F, public employee discipline dismissal, release employment. We will now move to closed session and we will return to open session at 6 p.m. Good evening and welcome, welcome to our board meeting of June 13th, 2023. The time is 6.03. We have two readouts from closed session. For item 4D, the roll call vote was seven yeses, zero noes. And for 4F, the roll call vote for, um, it is recommended that the board took action to release one temporary certificated employee related to education code 44954, effective at the end of the 2022-23 school year and direct the superintendent to send out appropriate legal notice. And now we will have our moment of reflection and our Pledge of Allegiance led by our student board member, Marcy Cope. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now we have the adoption of the minutes from the May 16th meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Weigand. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Trustee Bartow? Yes. Okay. Next, we have introdu introduction of new staff. Ms. Shields? We are very excited to introduce this evening Dr. Jason Konsawicki, who is joining us. Uh, he will be joining as principal at California Elementary School, he brings over 25 years of experience from a classroom teacher to principal to district office. He has every perspective. He has an incredible range of talents and skills, and I'd like to welcome him to the podium. I don't see the microphone. Is there a microphone? I don't think I need one. Okay. Do I press, do I press the button? Or I, you'll be fine. Just oh, continue to oh. speak. Good evening, uh, board members and, and cabinet. Um, 
I wanted to uh, thank you guys so much for this opportunity. Um, um, joining me, oh, I remember. Um, joining me this evening is my wife Nina and our daughter Karis. Please. So I, I can't tell you how excited I am to join the California community. I, I feel like I'm already a member of the community. If the board isn't aware, I got to attend the first flag deck ceremony um, where the students got to ask me questions. Um, I got to meet the staff before the flag deck, and I got to meet the foundation and the PTA after the flag deck ceremony. And also, my wife and I got to attend um, their musical presentation of Annie. Amazing. <laughs> so I can't wait to get started. I already feel like I'm part of the family, and I, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity. Thank you guys very, very much. Thank you. are a part of the family if you've gotten to see their show choir. So I'm glad you got to see that. Um, next up, we have recognition of spring athletic sports champions. Ms. Torres. Good evening, everyone. It is always my pleasure to uh, announce these wonderful winners and bring up our principals. We are so uh, blessed to have such amazing competitive sports teams, and they just continue to win and win, and this season was no different. So we are going to go ahead and start with... Um, Costa Mesa High School, Varsity Boys Swim. I'd like to invite Dr. Potnitz up. And so we'll get our athletes in queue. Well, our athletics are thriving this year. So President Anderson, members of the board, Superintendent Smith, Executive Cabinet, and guests. Well, I think, where are the boys? They're Outside. in queue. <laughs> All right, they're in a corner. Come on in! <laughs> there they are. There they are. Come on in! So our boys swim showed great strength and tenacity and teamwork during the swim season. We want to congratulate them on all their efforts and their victories, in addition to their coaches, obviously. Winning CIF was an amazing accomplishment, and watching their enthusiasm during their celebration in the pool <laughs> afterwards was heartwarming. So we're, we're here to congratulate you, celebrate you, and we also want to say um, we see similar things happening uh, next season as well. So congratulations to everybody. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Um, 
Um, moving on, I'd like to welcome up Dr. Uh, Jake Haley, so he will introduce his champions. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, President Anderson, members of the board, Dr. Smith, Executive Cabinet, distinguished guests. It's an honor to be up here to talk about uh, three CIF champions uh, this year in the spring for uh, Corona Del Mar High School. And the theme of aquatics, not being able to be here tonight, uh, neither our coach, uh, Coach Capitan, and then uh, Maggie Shallow, a recent graduate. She's heading off to Virginia uh, to go swim and continue her swim career. She was a 100 fly uh, champion this year, Division I CIF. So let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> And then we're going to have Coach Jamie come up next. Coach Jamie's going to come in with our uh, CIF individual tennis champion, Division One. You're going to hear amazing things about this athlete and uh, what transcribed uh, this spring. So, uh, Coach Jamie, come on up and uh, just sing all the great things, uh, what's going on with tennis. Go. Oh, okay. Uh, I sent something in to carry, but this is Niels Hoffman, our CIF champion. He had an amazing year this year. He was 51-5 and five in wow. singles play, led the team in passion, effort, energy, and uh, performance in practice, which is an amazing thing. Sometimes your best player doesn't always bring it to practice, but Niels does. Uh, keeps me creative as a coach, and uh, always loves to inspire his teammates. I thought his, his accolades on the court were impressive. I thought as a teammate he was even more impressive, and I think that just goes to show what type of student athlete he is, and just an amazing uh, student athlete at CDM to represent the Sea Kings. Just take two steps this way. <laughs> but the camera works this time. <laughs> you're good, you're good. Thank you. Thank you. Stay in root on Ava, though, as she comes up. Yeah, and then our last uh, CIF champion this spring uh, was in track and field. And uh, if you've been to Corona Del Mar, uh, it's very rare that you can introduce a coach where the uh, track is actually named after him. So uh, it's my pleasure to bring up uh, Coach Sumner to come talk about Ava. And our My name's up there, but I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are very lucky that we have Ava with us today. Uh, she is a tramp from Australia. What a treat. I mean, this was just one full pleasure. Um, but it hasn't all been pleasant. There's a little bit of a headache here going on. As the principal just told you, we have a new scoreboard that's being built. It's supposed to be done in November. Thank God it wasn't. Every week she breaks the school record. This is the last month he broke his three school records, right? And one semester, all the way, not just not just CIF. She went to the Masters meet, made it to 100 and she learned there, and then she went to the state championships also. So she went as far as you can go, that's how far she went. And it's it was really interesting because you go, people will tell you, you yeah, know, these kids work so hard. And, We've been with them. Some of them do, and some of them don't. But this is what it does. You guys laugh, but that's what I'm trying to teach. I'm trying to teach people what 100 percent is, and she's been real close. Cool, so I should have it done by next year. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things she's very, very hard worker, but we don't want to forget Kaylon. Kaylon had a big piece. Of, Coach Kaylon had a big piece of her running this fast. She's pretty good. She's pretty talented. But I think without the support group and the taxi driver, your mom. <laughs> You want to say anything? I'm the only one that can let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I didn't like to say anything, but I just want to say I'm really thankful for all my coaches and my teammates and my family. I just want to say Thank <laughs> you. 
our final um, athletic group tonight will be represented by uh, Dr. Jerry Murray from Newport Harbor High School. Good evening. Um, my name is Jerry Murray. I'm the athletic director at Newport Harbor High School. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Smith, President Anderson, and the board for inviting our boys here tonight to meet. Um, we had a great year. We started off with a repeat champion, CIF and national champion, and we ended the year with a repeat champion, uh, CIF and national champion again. So um, it, the team went 32-0. and 0. Um, A lot of you board members came to the game and watched them uh, win it against CDM, which made it even more special. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, three of our boys are um, going on to play at the next level, and uh, they've done a great job. Uh, they're twice back-to-back uh, -back champions, so I'd like to introduce their coach, Coach Mabry. I uh, just want to say thank you for recognizing these guys. I'm excited to introduce them to you tonight. Um, they, they did a tremendous job, obviously. Uh, it was an outstanding season for us. First team ever in school history to go back-to-back. -back. Uh, we have a great tradition of success, but that's a pretty unique trait, and these guys uh, are deserving of this recognition. So I'll introduce them to you tonight. Uh, first, assistant coach Oliver Pick. Uh, Ray Spartan. Luca Kirchi. Corbin Francisco. Riggs guy. Charlie Harrington. Lucas Johnson. Carter Moore. Jack O'Neill. Reed O'Neill. Tommy Ransom. Jake Reed. Grayson Springboard. Taylor Swanson. Walker Bicek. Jack Bonder. Hey, you guys in two rows, tall, less tall. Next, we have our recognition of Newport Mesa Student Award winners, Ms. Torres. We're going to start with the elementary excellence you see in the crowd today, and Dr. Sir is going to come up and explain why all these amazing Davis students are in the audience today. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, President Anderson, board members, Dr. Smith, uh, cabinet, and esteemed guests. Um, I am thrilled to announce that this year, Davis Magnet School has been recognized as one of the five schools in Orange County that received the 2023 Outstanding PAL Peer Assistance Leadership Program Award from the Orange County Department of Education. The PAL Peer Assistance Leadership Program is a school-based peer-to-peer youth development program for students in grades 4 through 12 built upon a philosophy of students helping students. The mission of the PAL program is, develop, is to develop youth leaders who connect with their peers to create a caring, safe, and supportive school environment for all. PAL peer leaders help build a positive school climate through youth leadership, mentoring, conflict resolution, cross-age teaching, peer helping, service learning, and prevention activities. The PAL program supports skill development in the areas of leadership, communication, team building, and problem solving. The, problem, the program can be implemented as a club, a class, or incorporated into an existing leadership program where students receive training in the PAL curriculum and plan campus outreach activities. An effective PAL program can help schools implement many of the research-based activities that enhance youth engagement and connectedness to the school and community, which are two of the most important, pro important protective factors for all types of high-risk behaviors. With us tonight to speak about this outstanding accomplishment is Christy Flores, Director of Engagement, Partnership, and Expanded Learning, who knows a few things about Davis Magnet School, having served as principal there for the last 10 years. So I would like to ask Christy to come on up and talk about Good evening, President Anderson, school board members, Dr. Smith, executive cabinet, and its esteemed guests. It is my pleasure to talk to you about the Davis Magnet School PAL program. As for the past five years, the Davis Peer Assistant Leadership Team has made a positive impact across the Davis Magnet School campus, local community, and Southern California. The efforts of this year's current student leadership team made up of 26 fifth and sixth grade students, under the guidance of Lisa Holman, Emily Matthews, and Kelly Galen, all contributed to the welcoming positive environment at Davis that includes building leadership capacity with empathy and compassion. The Davis Powell program has facilitated philanthropic events benefiting Project Hope Alliance, military families, and the Jesse Reese Foundation Never Ever Give Up Pediatric Cancer Support Program. Additionally, Powell students led our PBIS behavior rotations modeling expected behaviors across the campus. This past year, the PAL program hosted a new student luncheon, led recess games twice a week, conducted student read-alouds focusing on kindness and empathy, and were instrumental in the installation of our new buddy bench in collaboration with Patrick's Purpose and the Exchange Club of Newport Harbor. It is my honor and with enormous Davis Ducks pride to introduce <laughs> the Davis Magnet School PAL teacher mentors and student leaders who were the only PAL program in Newport Mesa Unified School District and the only elementary school in Orange County to be named a 2023 Outstanding Peer Assistant Leadership Program by the Orange County Department of Education. invite our three outstanding teachers to the front, Lisa Holman, Kelly Galen, and Emily Matthews. <laughs> and to my student leaders, when you hear your name, just come on up front to receive your certificate. We do have 26 students who originally made up the program. One student moved out of the state. Majority of our students are here, but I will read every student's name. Ryder Bringle. <laughs> Santi Carrera. <laughs> Django Cordemanche. <laughs> C. 
Sierra De La Hara. Jay DeSico. Emma Freeland. Mika Hilton. Jay Stromson. Sarah Jordan. Finley Jolfs. Liam Lavoy. Addison McFarland. Charlotte McFarland. Gwen McGarry. Eleanor McGrady. John Molina. Walker Oni. Danny Pang. Luigi Para. Carter Patterson. Mila Sanchez. Evie Chapeyoun. Delaney Sino. Kelly Swinney. And Elliot Wool Smith. Congratulations, Davis Powell Program, and thank you so much for your service to our campus and community. Thank you, Davis. Um, additionally tonight, we have two other additional awards um, for the California St State PTA Reflections Contest. So every year, our PTA asks our students and offers them the opportunity to participate in the State PTA Reflections Contest. And we are very proud today to have two merit winners within our district. So first, I'd like to know if uh, Gabby Sabatka is in the audience. I know I wasn't able to make contact with her parents from East Bluff. Is Gabby in the audience tonight? Okay, we'll find, we will find Gabby over the summer and give her her certificate. But we would like to um, welcome, up, welcome up Zorar Zuber from Costa Mesa Middle. And Dr. Potnas, I know you're in the audience. Would you mind joining our students? And thank you very much for our photo <laughs> opportunity while I say some wonderful words. Zarar participated in the 22-23 Reflections Art Program that has been bringing arts to life for more than 10 million students since 1969. Our California State PTA and its members and families and kids do an amazing job of bringing awareness and sharing the importance of arts education. Zarar is an outstanding student at Costa Mesa who works hard is kind, loves to learn, and eager to please. 
He helps his classmates all the time and enjoys learning from all his teachers. He earned the Award of Merit for his original artwork submission in literature for the theme show, Your Voice. We are very proud of you, Zarar, for this recognition. Thank you. All right. Next, we have our student board member reports, Trustee Crane. Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, we have the absolute pleasure of, before doing our reports, is recognizing our amazing dream team of student board members from all of our high school sites. Please stand. Tonight, we're gonna recognize your commitment and your dedication to not only your campuses, but to also our school district as a whole. Your passion has been immeasurable because you have come here with a voice from your own campuses and you've shared it with us because we are not there every day, all day. And you are. So you are the voice of truth. You're the voice of what we set to accomplish as a, as a board of trustees. So thank you so much for your pride in your school and the fact that you have graduated or moved on because one of you is a junior rising senior and that you are here beyond school being out proves to us that you are our dream team. Thank you. So why don't you come up and we're gonna give you a certificate. Uh, President Anderson. from Costa Mesa High School, and also Ethan Krauss from Early College High School. However, they cannot be here tonight uh, for various reasons. So we recognize them as well in spirit. And next up, we have our oh yes, we're having our reports yes. from our student board members. We're not going to let you off that easy. So uh, tonight, the report is, topic is, in your opinion, what is one happening at your campus or at our board meetings that were most memorable or impactful uh, this year? So if you want to look back, also please share two end of the year highlights from your campuses. And we can begin with Marcy Cope from Back Bay Monta Vista. Moss is going to be doing the oh, yes. report oh, for today. Moss, come on up. Good evening, Superintendent Smith, President Anderson, board members, cabinet, and community. The student board members were asked what were the most memorable or impactful things to happen during our time as student board representatives. One of the most impactful moments on campus for Back Bay was getting a new principal and having him enact changes on school and on campus. And overall, making it a more pleasant place. Another very impactful moment was seeing how many amazing students got scholarships at the end of the year luau. 
One of the most impactful moments on the board member for Marcy as well as myself was when in response to a large number of crowds voicing their controversial opinions on somewhat improperly <laughs> during the board meetings, we got to see the board handle it respectfully and gracefully. Two major highlights from the past month have been our grad night for our seniors at Six Flags, as well as graduation that went very smoothly for our proud Bulldogs. Thank you all for your time. It has been an honor serving, and have a great end of your year. Mm. Thank you. Next, we have Marcelina from Early College High School. Good evening, Superintend Superintendent Smith, President Anderson, and members of the board. I want to start off by thanking you for giving me the opportunity to stand in front of you and the public and talk about my school and how we have been doing throughout the school year. I've gotten to learn the concerns of parents and different changes that have occurred on different campuses while being at these board meetings. I've also been able to make changes on my campus and become more involved, more involved than I have before. One memorable event from the school year was painting a new mural. I felt that our school needed something for students to be excited about and thought that by painting a new mural, students would come together and be a part of something new. I'm happy that we completed it and hope to have a small gathering sometime in the future to thank everyone who helped make it possible. I really do believe that working together can bring positive change. Another exciting event that happened was um, our seniors and the scholarships that they have gotten, such as the Gates Scholarship and the Angel Scholarship. So those are really big um, scholarships and awards that students have gotten. And as well as how our school and seniors have come together to also share um, advice to upcoming seniors, I mean, yeah, upcoming seniors and just other students in general. I'm excited to see um, who the next board member will be that will be taking my position. And I just know that the ones that um, applied are just amazing and are also in ASB and have shown so much leadership potential. Um, as I enter my senior year, I'm going to have a positive outlook on what is to come. So thank you so much. Thank you, Marcelina. And next up is Fernando from Estancia High School. Good evening, Superintendent Smith, uh, President, uh, Board President Bart uh, Anderson, sorry. And uh, sorry, um, I, I didn't um, have this plan out yet, but uh, also good evening to Vice President uh, Crane and fellow Board of Trustees. Um, I am. I want to start by saying that I'm very thankful to have been part of, uh, part of the student board members for the 2022 to 2023 school year uh, of the Newport Mesa School District. Um, I wanted to say that it has been a pleasure being the student board member. Um, I've learned a lot from you guys, and I think it's great that we get to see a different side of how the uh, the school uh, leaders, you know, um, district um, leads the school, and how you guys have been able to. Um, support at my school, especially with the uh, um, new school theater that it will be, um, it will, that is in continued construction and will be uh, hopefully at our school soon. Um, I do want to mention my, well, for me, the most memorable um, end of the year event that we had at our school was um, our awards, our awards night and our um, pep assembly for. Um, for like uh, end of the year. Uh, it was great because I, from what I recall, we haven't had one in the past, mm. like since 2019, I think, for at Estancia. And it's been great because um, ASB worked a lot to uh, collaborate and gather memorable pictures throughout the whole school year. And we, we were able to play a video for everyone, um, all the students and the staff, and they all got to see the memories that we shared for this current year and for for what's to come and acknowledge the students that are going into the military that are going to take a gap year, going to go to four year or community college and do um, and, and, and continue to improve in their uh, future endeavors. Uh, two highlights that I d definitely do want to mention was um, how um, the Ask Random Kindness Club has um, continued to partner up with uh, the mental uh, health um, organization for the Orange County Department of Education and how we were able to spread more awareness towards mental health. And I'm grateful to also have been a, the president for that club. And 
Um, I also want to add that we had our, um, uh, we have a five star, like I mentioned before in previous meetings, and we had our end of the year points where uh, Mr. Hall and all the faculty and students that uh, volunteered, they got pied in the face like a week before, I think. Uh, definitely Mr. Hall was like, I could not see his face at all. Like, he was all like, it was, it was filled with whipped cream and so was Ms. Chamberlain and everyone else. And everyone had, had a great time, you know. And definitely what really um, was the icing on top was with um, the um, therapy dogs that, um, at, that came to our campus and how students were able to connect with them and have the additional support as we continue to have finals. And although finals has been over and I'm officially done with high school since last Thursday, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm definitely um, excited for what's to come. And I'm, I'm glad to have the support from, from many of you. And I hope that whoever the next student board member of, will be at, from Estancia that they will continue to show th the best of our school and to advocate for what's important from our school. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we are going to move on to Harbor Council PTA, Andrea McGarry. McGarry. Good evening. Um, our president, Cynthia Strassman, sends her regards. She's on vacation. But she wanted to thank the board, Superintendent Smith, President Anderson, and for everyone else that is here, and the partnership and the support with all of our PTA units. Um, we've been wrapping up our school year. Um, school's out. And um, welcome to summer. But she wanted me to share just a little bit that she asked um, we asked all the schools, tell us what you're most excited to, to brag about. What were you excited that was accomplished? From our Corona Del Mar zone, um, sorry, okay. Um, East Bluff uh, rebuilt their school garden for all the students. And Lincoln um, in, uh, integrated STEM program bi-weekly for all of their students. In the Costa Mesa zone, College Park implemented some STEM and a literacy night. And at Killybrook, they also implemented a lot more STEM on their campus as well. Um, in Estancia, Adams had more field trips and a family fiesta. At Estancia, the executive board was able to step up and make every event more successful with the leadership that came with it. At Pomona, they had imagination machine, a trunk or tree, and art explorers. And in Newport Harbor zone, Back Bay, they were most proud of providing 36 of their students with a leadership and team building opportunity. Um, in Ensign, they were able to, to purchase spirit t-shirts for every student. And over at Mariners, they were able to provide all the members of the Mariners community with opportunities to be involved and feel connected with one another. And that's just a small snippet of all the schools within our school district. Um, for about 17 more days, I'm still the Davis PTA president, so I was really, really proud of those kids. Um, one of them was my own child. Um, so in about 17 days, I will no longer be their PTA president, but um, this year I was also Harbor Council PTA VP over membership, and I will also have that position next year going forward. Um, PTAs across our district, we were able to impact over 17,000 students this school year through connecting through community engagement, implementing programs and different events to build our communities up at our, all these school sites. Um, I'm just so, so proud of all of them. And we've also implemented um, a mentoring program where everybody here on Harbor Council, we mentor two or three different schools, building those communities, building those partnerships, so that way we, all these schools don't feel like they're, they're lost in the ocean of all these other schools. So if they ever have a question, they know they can reach out to one of us and building those relationships and making it more of a Newport Mesa <coughs> district instead of my school versus your school. Um, we also voted in our new officers. Um, I know Michelle got a new position. Um, I will be returning back as um, VP over membership. So to brag about the membership this year, last year we had 5,555, the four fives, and my goal this year was that we were gonna beat it by 3%. That was my goal as a district. We didn't beat it by 
we beat it by 14.2%. We ended this year. year with over 6,470 memberships, which was a 14.2% increase over last year's. Um, we had 15 schools pass their, their numbers from last year's, and so I was really proud of those 15. They all got a certificate, and I rang the bell. And of those 15, 12 had over a 3% increase, which was our goal. The majority of these schools had an increase of over 13%. Most were between 13 and 50. Um, but our top four schools was Mariners. They went from 204 to 408, which was a 50% increase. Sonora went from 56 to 147 members. That's a 61.9% wow. increase. Ray went from 56 to 211, what? which is a 73.4% increase. Crazy. And our number one spot that I was so, so <clears throat> proud because they really worked hard for this. Anderson went from 23 members to 180 members this year, wow. which is an 87.2% increase. And I was so proud of all of them. They all got a certificate letting them know how proud we were on behalf of Harbor Council to not only to their school site. That way they can show their schools how well that they were doing. And I was so proud that they were out in the community telling them all the amazing things that PTA was doing on their own school sites. And then a little shout out for my own school, Davis. Um, we went to, we got a 23% increase and we had the highest number in the entire school district with 1,323 members um, for their membership drive. And um, population is around 500 and there's high schools with oh, about four more times that and they still had the most in the school district. Um, so membership starts officially July 1st. If you have not joined, please wait until July 1st. Um, I do recommend everyone to join the schools that are in your area, join your children's schools, join the schools they used to go to, support your PTA. And I know all of you do support the PTAs within your own um, trustee areas, and I do appreciate that. So on behalf of Harbor Council PTA, thank you very much. Thank you. And next up, we have our NMFT president, Rhonda Reed. Good evening, President Anderson, trustees, Dr. Smith, cabinet, and guests here tonight. Another school year concluded last week. <laughs> Students and te teachers celebrated their accomplishments accomplishments through the year with resiliency, hard work, determination, and I hope joy and laughter. As we look toward the next school year, I want to express our gratitude to the school board and district for making school safety a priority for our students and staff and for the thoughtful decisions made for the educational leaders throughout the school district for the best success at each school site. We are appreciative of the school board for caring for the whole student, including their social emotional development, which can have a tremendous impact on student achievement. Thank you for putting a credentialed school counselor at each elementary site. I know these school counselors will promote a positive school climate, um, provide critical behavioral supports, ensure students' well-being, improving opportunity and outcomes for all students. Thank you. Next is our CSEA president, Stu Tedford. President Anderson, trustees, Superintendent Smith, cabinet, and esteemed guests. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is thank uh, the team, because uh, uh, I consider us all a team, uh, for the work that you all did to uh, incentivize and to recognize our instructional aides going forward with the extended hours. Um, 
the issue that we have is that we just don't serve our students in the capacity that we believe we can. And the extended hours are really going to make a big difference in that, considering that we're going to have almost nine hours of instruction on our campuses going forward. It's really a big deal to us, and we really do appreciate the hard work and, and the dedication that you have to help us do better for our students. Um, uh, I'd also like to just thank you all, like I always say, for the relationships and the leadership, because when we do things together, uh, we get the results that we're looking for. Um, and when we put the kids first, that always ends up being something positive for everybody. Um, we, we strive every day to be role models, even from the maintenance side when we're on campus, to let the kids know that somebody's out there doing the work for them. You know, we, we know we get paid, but we really are here for you. We really are here for the kids, and, and we really do want them to thrive and just to, uh, to be able to be themselves when they're on campus and not feel like things are going to be bad, that we really are an inclusive district because you've really wrapped me up in your family, and, and I feel like we can do anything when we act the way that we do together. We learn, experience, and grow, and we become something that is really a formidable force. And um, as I'm on these uh, interview panels, I really see the quality of folks that not only we have here, which are better than the candidates we're seeing, but there are a lot of folks coming through that really want to come to our district and make a difference because it is such a great place to be. We really do put kids first and we put our employees first. And when we do that, we all thrive. So I want to say thank you all for your leadership, your kindness shown to me when we interact together, and how great it is to have you guys support us from the classified side. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Next, we will do number 15, community input on non-agendized items. Trustee Weigand. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items not on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on non-agenda topics are limited to three minutes per topic, up to 20 minutes, uh, three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to any other person. By order of the Brown Act, section 54954.2, the board will take no action nor have any discussion on non-agendized items. The superintendent may provide clarification during superintendent's comments. Thank you. First up is Maria Aravalo. Yes, and she gets extra time for the translation. Okay. Madam President, Board Members, Superintendent Smith, mi nombre es María Arevalo. Estoy aquí porque mi hijo estaba en Adams School, tiene nueve años, y había un niño que lo molestaba mucho, específicamente todo el año. Mi niño lo golpeó. Y mi hijo fue suspendido de la escuela por eso. Uh, y, y luego uh, la directora nada más me llamó al siguiente día para decirme que mi hijo no puede ir más a la escuela Adams, que necesita ir a Wilson porque es la que le corresponde. ¿Me permite? Uh -huh. uh, ¿Tiene que ir a Wilson ahora? Ajá. Uh -huh. okay. Madam President, uh, members of the cabinet, Superintendent Smith, uh, my name is Maria Arevalo. I'm here because uh, my son was having issues with another student at Adams. He is nine years old. Um, he was being bothered the whole year uh, until my son uh, basically got tired and hit him. My son was suspended. Uh, the principal called me the next day and told me my son could not attend Adams anymore and that he would have to go to Wilson. No me dio nada por escrito, no me hizo una junta, ni investigó el caso, no sé qué pasó. Uh, pero necesito que por favor esto se investigue porque mi hijo está mal. Mi hijo su lloró por, por 25 minutos en la oficina de la directora. Por 25 minutos sin decir nada, no les contestaba nada. No quería hablar de, de, de eso porque ya lo había dicho antes y nadie hizo caso. El niño le decía tonto, estúpido, cosas así. Y no, 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 es, no es bueno para mi hijo. 
So nothing was provided in writing. Uh, nothing was uh, provided to me in any information about the case. Um, so I need an investigation to be done. Uh, my boy is in a very bad state right now. At that time, um, he cried. He was feeling bad. He cried for about 25 minutes in the principal's office. Uh, he didn't want to talk. He didn't want to share anything about what had happened. Um, but he had shared uh, to all school administration and other people that he was having trouble with this other child. Me gustaría que por favor um, investiguen y, y que me llamen para una junta. Yo necesito saber porque mi hijo necesita um, aprender que las cosas se solucionan. Hay formas de solucionarlas, no con golpe. Hay otras formas. Entonces, él necesita aprender y yo necesito enseñarle. Por favor, llámenme para una junta. So I would like an investigation uh, to be started. I'd like someone to call me to set up a meeting. Um, I know that my son needs to learn that there are other solutions besides uh, violence or hitting other children. Um, so my son needs to learn this. I want to teach him this. So please give me a call so we can meet about this. Thank you. Gracias. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Elise Ibarra. Hi, uh, greetings. My name is Elise Ibarra. Um, I've had the great honor to teach uh, high school theater at CDMHS for five years now. Uh, we're an award-winning theater program who's just won Best Musical in Orange County for Chicago. And our total program uh, has won 10 Cappy Awards, 18 Macy Awards, and three CETA Awards this year alone, half of which are for technical theater. Uh, we're not only teaching the art of acting in our classes, but also the art of speaking through our hands and using it in a uh, beautiful way. Uh, we've been so blessed uh, to receive support from our amazing board and our community and our leaders. And I was advised uh, to chat with you a little bit today. I'm coming you, to you tonight uh, with my student assistant, technical director, and award-winning set designer, Jan Hendricks, who will be talking soon, um, about the needed proper access to the theater to give a full education for theater arts. Access to the theater for theater technicians means the use of the space, uh, keys to our booth, uh, sound board and light, room, uh, light board, um, and recently installed emergency work light tamper switches, and uh, green run access for on-site training and safety when allocated. Uh, my students have worked tirelessly before, during, and after school to put on productions and projects that they are proud of. They are constantly building new skills, uh, learning to lead, and are training for future opportunities in jobs um, through each class and each production. This year's access to the theater and equipment therein has been highly restricted in class uh, for productions, um, as in the contrast of years before. As a CTE theater educator, our job is to train students in class. Um, and uh, for the possible jobs um, in the creative sectors with professionals in the fields. But not giving get the needed training and resources needed for the field is obstructing their learning and deterring them from possible career opportunities. In my 20 years of being a technician and a mentor uh, artist around Orange County, I've learned that theater students truly need hands-on learning experiences to flourish. Without these tools, it's close to impossible to create an environment that supports education through the arts. I'm asking for us to consider giving access, direct access uh, for education in the arts um, so that my students can grow and learn and excel. We thank you for your loving support, and we, uh, I can't wait to, for you to hear from our student, Jan Hendricks. Thank you. Next, we have Jan Hendricks. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Jan Hendricks, and I have been the set designer for Corona Del Mar High School for the past four years. Uh, this class means a lot to me. I originally joined my freshman year because my brother was in the acting class with Missy Barra. 
and I wanted to be part of the backstage process. I immediately fell in love with the program and made many friends, memories, and lifelong, fr lifelong friendships that I will always remember. On campus, I play three varsity sports, basketball, softball, and lacrosse. This consumes my time heavily, and I usually am at school for all day. Being able to have access to the theater during class is crucial for our award-winning department because students that are involved with other extracurricular activities, clubs, sports, ASB, and more have little to no free time to spend elsewhere. When I can make it to the rehearsal to work backstage, building, designing, and constructing, constructing, sometimes I have to work in the classroom when space isn't available. Not having a completed set for the actors comes to comes into play when our space isn't accessible and creates more challenges for us designers. Although problem solving is one of our greatest strengths, having our space to create, enjoy, and utilize our materials makes us the best of the best. Having our access to our own theater would help us help our department grow in many ways by letting us get our work done in class so we can be efficient during our limited time and continue using our time for other activities, clubs, and more. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Amy Muir. Hi, board members. Hi, Dr. Smith. Hi, community. My name is Amy Muir. I've been a Mariner's L parent for eight years. I have a child at Harbor and one who just finished fourth grade at Mariner's. I'm here to address a few small online outbursts, asking that books at our wonderful school library be banned. Why is banning books un-American and undemocratic? First of all, it violates the First Amendment. As one of my favorite journalists recently stated, children do not check their constitutional rights at the school door. Everyone should support the First Amendment. First thing first, I've reviewed many of these books. They're not obscene, they aren't pornographic, and they never have been. These books have been discussed by a very fringe element as written from a perspective that's diverse. Banned books are almost always written by or about persons of color, LGBTQ persons. These books are important. They offer a diversity of perspective. Schools belong to our community. They don't belong to a few loud voices that seem to want to return to purity culture. These books have been evaluated by our trusted educators and librarians. I've read these books. I'm a nurse and a parent. In Utah, there's a district called Davis that led to the Bible recently being removed from the school library because it violated the district policy on violence and vulgarity. I need to remind you all that the Bible also includes instances of incest, prostitution, and rape. Schools belong to all of us. They belong to all community members. I don't want a few people controlling the information my child learns from, and you shouldn't either. The grooming argument they keep bringing up isn't validated by research. Grooming isn't accomplished by people reading about bodies and people different than you. Having books that encourage critical thinking is one of the best ways to battle indoctrination, which occurs when you restrict access to information. I talked sex ed for many years. I know firsthand that knowledge is power. Lastly, we live in a free society where you might not agree with others, but the most important thing is to decide what's right within your own home as a parent. Learning how to disagree respectfully is a skill that builds all of us as citizens. We can't build that skill if one very small group, loud group, decides on what to control access to information, decides what's acceptable and what's not. Book bans in history have never been on the right side. They have been used for control in Afghan, if Afghanistan and Iran. They aren't safe. Please support our First Amendment and please support our school libraries. Thank you. Thank you. Jill Mather. Good evening. Thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Jill Mather. I'm a graduate of Corona Del Mar High School many years ago. Uh, I have children who will be coming into Newport Mesa in the next couple of years. And I, too, would like to echo what Amy had said in support of our First Amendment um, and the importance of offering a wide variety of books uh, to provide different perspectives. It enhances our understanding of the world around us and challenges our children to think critically. Um, it is so important for our First Amendment rights. Um, and an effort to ban books is undemocratic. Uh, 50 years ago, the Supreme Court decided in Miller v. California that um, 
this was a violation of the First Amendment. And it also put a very narrow exception, I'm sure you are aware of it, um, defining obscenity um, that um, the First Amendment, speech is only obscene, um, the protection, it, there must be a serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. Um, and it's not what these books are offering. I implore you to support your librarians and our children and keep these books in the library. Thank you. Next is Slavika Milo. Um, then we have Justin Ratke. Hey everyone, um, this is my first time doing something like this, so I'm a little unfamiliar. But um, yeah, I just wanted to voice a concern, um, re representing a voice of uh, many parents that have students alongside my student or my son um, who are in Newport Mesa and have shared the LGBTQ flag flying in all the classrooms, um, not all of them, but some of them. And, you know, there's one flag that should be flown in the classrooms, and it's the American flag. Uh, it's, it's, my, my son was concerned about bringing this up until the end of the school year because he felt like his grade was going to suffer. He felt like something bad was gonna to happen to him if he voiced his concern along with some of the other students that I've spoken to and other parents as well. And um, you know, I know that it's, it's a flag that is being flown in the name of diversity and inclusiveness. Um, however, it is the most <laughs> exclusive flag being flown. Um, the most inclusive flag is the Stars and Stripes. That's why everybody wants to come and live in the United States. <laughs> you know, we have a million people wanting to live here every year. Um, so, you know, I, with that, I just want to put a request into, I don't know how it works, but if teachers could not fly that flag and honor our country with the American flag only, that would be great. So that's all I have to say. Next up, we have Lynn Riddle. Uh, good evening, I am Lynn Riddle, and by way of background to my comment, I am a retired federal judge, and most recently, but formally too, an adjunct professor of law at UC Irvine School of Law. As I previously wit witnessed of late, there have been too many baseless, untethered accusations directed toward this board, the superintendent, and all in the Newport Mesa family, regarding library book content, as well as a condemnation of the district for complying with state mandates regarding affirmation and support of students' gender, all genders. Most of the meritless co public commenters here have claimed that the district actions violate what they claim are their parental rights to direct the education of their children. Yes, there is. And, absol and absolutely a constitutional right afforded to parents. That right, however, is the right to choose to send their child either to a public school or to a private one. That is their exercisable constitutional right. Accordingly, the par parental rights that some claim at a public school board meeting are expressly and constitutionally limited. They're limited by their, the choice that they've made to send their children to public school. As the Ninth Circuit in 2002 so clearly affirmed and held in Fields versus Palmdale schools, where the issue there was the lawfulness of the school districts administering to seven to 10 year olds a survey that contains a few sexual thought questions, 
<coughs> no Supreme Court opinion has ever, and I quote from that opinion, afforded the parents the right to compel public schools to follow the parents' own idiosyncratic vote views of what information the schools may disperse. And I continue from the case. Parents have the right to inform their children when and as they wish subject on the subject of sex, but they do not have a constitutional right to prevent a public school from providing its students with whatever information it wishes to provide, sexual or otherwise, when and as the school determines that it is appropriate to do so. As a community member, I thank the board, the superintendent, and all of the teachers of this district for their brilliant and noble work that you do every single day. It was glorious to be here today. The continuation and the viability of your work is absolutely essential to the survival, survival and the strengthening of our democracy to assuring liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have superintendent's comments. Uh, to our first speaker, um, la señora Arevalo, uh, voy a asegurar que mi equipo le llama um, esta semana. So, uh, to those of you that don't speak Spanish, I just wanted to reassure uh, the first speaker that our team will reach out when someone brings a concern like that. We reach out immediately, which we will do. Um, with regard to the CDM theater access, Congratulations on the Cappies uh, and the great success there. I know that your, your principal and community are so proud of the work you do as is this school board, and you'll see that pride shortly. Um, I was also brought up to speed a little bit today, and I know that uh, Dr. Haley is prioritizing uh, some work around so that you can have the appropriate access to the facilities that you need. So I know that he's already looking into this and look forward to uh, his resolution working with all of you and with the district. Uh, as it relates to libraries uh, and banning of books, uh, that's, I've mentioned that before here, not to be redundant, but there's no interest um, in this district to ban books. Um, that's not what we're about. Uh, we've mentioned that uh, on, on multiple occasions. Um, and I did hear in the, in the last comment a concern about us removing books in the Mariner's Library. Um, and, and just to clarify, we, we don't control the content there. Um, so we're not going into Mariner's Library. It's a city library. We're certainly not going to go in and take books out. And I do know they have a process for reviewing content there. I would just ask you to check with them to see what that is. If you have an issue, we do have an interest in making sure that we um, strengthen our agreement with the city so that as we look at content, um, the things that we value in this district um, and the books that, that we like to have in our libraries are also there. So we're going to work on that, how we co-create that learning space with them uh, moving forward. And then as it relates to um, flags there, um, first off, no student should ever feel threatened against retaliation for respectfully mentioning something that they feel. And, and my staff and all of us in this district will make sure that the kids have a forum to respectfully share their opinions. Um, I would also say, too, there's no prohibition of flags in this district unless the flag's being used inappropriately. Um, certainly replacing the American flag with a different flag would be an appropriate use of the flag. But let's not create a false dichotomy. We have lots of flags in the classrooms, flags from multiple countries. Um, we have a lot of flags, um, and we have one national flag that flies in every classroom and on every campus in this district. So we don't want to conflate that. I, I would like to take this opportunity, though, to, because the word was used, um, I want to thank our, our teachers and support staff, everyone that does the work of, um, of really struggling every day to ensure that we're creating inclusive learning environments in every classroom that makes sure that every single student is seen, heard, valued, and safe. That we should celebrate. And um, yeah, that's, that's all I have. Next, we have community input on agendized items. Trustee Wigand. 
This is an opportunity for the public to address the board regarding items on the regular meeting agenda. Comments on agenda items are limited to three minutes per comment, up to 20 minutes per topic. A speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another person. Speaker cards for items on the discussion action calendar may be held until that item is considered by the board if the speaker prefers. We don't have any. Okay. Um, number 18, reports. Report on DWAC, our District English Learner Advisory Committee. Ms. Shields? We are very excited to welcome up the entire DLAC team. We have Laura Del Pash and our officers, our parent officers. So I welcome Laura to the board and I thank our officers and every DLAC meeting member for everything they invested in the DLAC community. There's their schools and their students' future. And without further ado. Thank you. Oh, there we go. It's like, what do I do? Get right there. Okay. President Anderson, board members, Superintendent Smith, cabinet, and guests, I am so privileged to be able to present to you our District English Learner Advisory Committee, or DLAC report, for the 2022-23 school year. You have the full report, copies of the full report. Um, I'm just gonna do, I'm talking very little because it's about our parents sharing with you. Um, so I'm gonna share just a few, um, little bit of information about DLAC and then they'll come up and share some highlights and recommendations with you. So just to review the purpose of our DLAC committee is to advise the Newport Mesa Unified School District on programs and services for English learners. And we do that in a variety of ways. Our DLAC is comprised of one to two parents from each of our school English Learner Advisory Committees, or ELACs, lots of acronyms, of course. <laughs> and DLAC is a really great way for parents to engage and connect with their children's education. It's a great opportunity for parents to learn as well as to serve their school community. We do have required topics per ed code. And we try to make those very meaningful and engaging, um, but we mix those with parent-generated topics. So our first meeting in the fall, we do a needs assessment with our parents and we generate those topics um, from our parent community. And so we try to balance each meeting with a little requirement and something that's parent-generated. So again, you have the full report. Um, it is my pleasure to have our chairpersons here tonight to share with you. So uh, Carmen Ramirez and Eduardo Martinez are chairpersons. Um, they are going to share a summary of some of the highlights and recommendations. Um, they will be speaking in Spanish, and then our school community facilitator that works with DLAC will share in um, English. So we're going to give Javier a little break. Um, and so I'm happy to welcome Carmen. Buenas tardes, Presidenta Anderson, Superintendente Smith y miembros de la mesa directiva. Mi nombre es Carmen Ramírez y soy la Presidenta de TILAC. Estas son las áreas destacadas de nuestro reporte anual. La, comu la comunicación con los representantes de TILAC es buena. Nos agradan todos los temas y requisitos legales. El personal hace, una, hace que la información sea fácil de entender También es agradable recibir una llamada telefónica personal, además de mensajes de texto y correos electrónicos. Por favor, continúen con estas formas de comunicación. Los padres apreciamos las medallas y reconocimientos. Estos reconocimientos nos hacen sentir orgullosos de ser parte de DILA como campeones. El personal está haciendo un gran trabajo alentando a los padres a participar en las reuniones de DILA y nos da la oportunidad de participar e interactuar con los coordinadores de la comunidad escolar. Las juntas de DILAC nos hacen sentir que nuestra voz importa y que el personal nos escucha. Se agradece también, por lo general, que un miembro de la mesa directiva está, asiste a todas las juntas de DILAC y se queda desde el principio hasta el final. Agradecemos al superintendente Smith porque hizo un espacio en su agenda 
para asistir a nuestra junta de DILAC y se tomó el tiempo para contestar a todas las preguntas que los padres hicimos. Tener un panel de estudiantes de inglés fue muy emotivo para los padres. Escuchar a los estudiantes y exalumnos haber logrado sus metas y estar en camino a las universidades. Haber logrado así, a, para llegar a las universidades. Fue muy agradable escuchar sobre la influencia de todas las coordinadoras de la comunidad escolar en sus vidas. La Feria de Recursos fue una buena oportunidad para que los padres conecten directamente con agencias y reciban información personalizada sobre el programa para apoyar a las familias con problemas. Asistir a la Conferencia de Asociación de Educación Bilingüe de California CABE fue una buena experiencia y agradecemos la oportunidad para los padres de la Mesa Directiva de DILAC. Fue muy emocionante que nuestro personal hiciera una presentación a la conferencia. Estamos muy motivados para ir a CABE el próximo año. Muchas gracias. Good evening, President Anderson, Superintendent Smith, and members of the Board of Education. My name is Jacqueline Gaitan, and I am a school community facilitator, and I will read the report in English. Good evening, President Anderson, Superintendent Smith, and members of the Board of Education. My name is Carmen Ramirez, and I am the DLAC President. These are the highlighted areas of the annual report. The communication with DLAC representatives is good. We would like, we like all the topics and legal requirements. The staff makes the information easy to understand and distribute the topics over meetings. It is nice to receive a personal phone call in addition to texts and emails. Please continue with these forms of communication. Parents appreciate the medals and awards. These recognitions make us feel proud to be part of DLAC, like champions. <laughs> Staff is doing a great job recruiting parents to participate in DLAC. And DLAC provides an opportunity to be involved and interact with the school community facilitators. DILAC meetings make us feel that our voice matters and the staff listens to us. It is appreciated that the board member, that a board member is usually in attendance and stays from the beginning to the end. We appreciate Superintendent Dr. Smith, <laughs> who made a space in his busy agenda to attend our DILAC meeting and took the time to answer all the questions parents ask. The student panel of English learners was very emotional for parents. Hearing from current students and alumni and their goals and journey to college inspired so many parents. It was nice to hear about the role of a school community facilitators in their lives. The resource fair was great it was an opportunity for parents to connect with agencies and receive important information. Attending the California Association for Bilingual Education CAVE conference was a good experience, and we appreciate the opportunity for the parents. It was exciting to have our staff present at the conference. We are very motivated to go to CAVE next year. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Ramirez. And now we have our other co-chairperson, Mr. Martinez. Uh, buenas tardes, President Anderson, Superintendent Smith. Ya lo conocía. Eh, gracias. Eh, miembros de la mesa directiva, mi nombre es Eduardo Martínez y soy presidente de DILAC. Estas son las recomendaciones de nuestro reporte anual. Se recomienda que los coordinadores de la comunidad escolar ayuden a comunicarse con los representantes de DILAC en, su, en sus escuelas. 
por ejemplo, por teléfono, mensaje de texto o carta. Además que envíen una carta formal impresa y la agenda a los padres antes de la junta. Es importante que todas las escuelas des designen un tiempo en la agenda de ILAC para que los representantes de DILAC compartan su informe. El próximo año nos gustaría que un oficial de policía hiciera una representación sobre drogas y actividades de pandillas en Costa Mesa. Ha habido un aumento desde la pandemia y queremos saber cómo aumentar la participación de los padres. Los padres de muchas escuelas asisten a clases de grupo Crecer. Las clases incluyen reflexiones, ayuda a cómo hablar con, los, con nuestros niños y adolescentes a construir relaciones, mejorar la comunicación y cómo escuchar las necesidades de nuestros hijos. Se recomienda continuar con esas clases. Gracias. Good evening, President Anderson, Superintendent Smith, and members of the Board of Education. My name is Eduardo Martinez, and I am DILAC President. <coughs> These are the recommendations for our annual report. It is recommended that the site school community facilitators help communicate with DILAC reps at their schools, for example, through phone calls text message or letters. In addition to the phone calls, emails, and text messages, please send us a hard copy, a <laughs> formal letter, and agenda to parents through the school community facilitators. It is important that at all sites, designate a time on the ELAC agenda for the DLAC reps to share their DLAC report. Next year, we would like a police officer to present on drugs and gun activities in Costa Mesa. There has been an increase since the pandemic, and we want to know how to increase parent involvement. Parents from many schools attend Grupo Crecer classes. The classes include reflections on how to help and talk with our children and teenagers to build relationships, improve communication, and how to listen to their needs. It is recommended to continue with Grupo Crecer classes. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of our report. Do you have any questions for our team? Yes. <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate uh, you being here tonight and sharing your thoughts and the, your candid thoughts. They're, they're constructive and uh, we can build from what you say and always do better. So thank you for your time. Just wanted to thank you for all that you have done for our students and for our children, for our parents and teachers, for our community. It is truly amazing all that you've been able to accomplish. And Carmen, watching your daughter graduate was a highlight of my last week. So thank you so much. You raised an amazing daughter. So excited to see what she goes and does. Congratulations. And I just want to say, uh, muchas gracias por su tiempo and corazón por the padres. You, Carmen, specifically, it's like 20 years, 20 years of caring 22. for our parents. <laughs> <laughs> so many years of caring for our parents in our, in our schools. So thank you so much for all of that time and dedication. Thank you. Next, we have report on local control and accountability plan and 2023-24 budget. 
So I am proud to introduce Vanessa Gailey, who will come up and share so much hard work. The LCAP document, as you know, is a beacon. It aligns with your board goals, and it really sets a path for us forward. Annually, we report on how we're doing and where we're going, and Vanessa has spent countless hours making sure that we're aligned, that this represents what's actually happening in the district and really is a, a go through for this plan, our site plans, all of our work, you'll see a harmony and continuity. So without further ado. Great, thank you. Well, um, President Anderson, Superintendent Smith, members of the board, executive cabinet, labor partners, and of course our esteemed guests. Um, so it's such a pleasure to be here and talk about the local control and accountability plan. I know the kids think this is the most wonderful time of the year, <laughs> but this is LCAP season, so this is our time of the year. And so we want to give you a quick overview of what the LCAP, the local control and accountability plan is, and share some of the highlights from this year's plan. It is a three-year plan. It is a state requirement for every district, and really what it demonstrates is alignment of budget to plan. You can picture myself and Jeff Trader arm in arm as we really co-develop and co-craft this document so that it reflects our budget priorities, your board priorities. And it must be board approved by June 30th each year. We present on one evening, we do a public hearing, and then it is approved at a subsequent meeting at which it must be sent to the Orange County Board of Edu Department of Education within five days. So the plan is based on the local control funding formula. It has a funding mechanism and an account accountability mechanism. And so LCFF is funding for most districts. And so there are different flavors of that funding. There's a base, which is really the general fund, but it's the base funding. And then there's supplemental funding. And this is really based on an additional count of students who have additional need. And so um, those students are low-income English learners and foster youth. And then there's a, a name called the unduplicated count. And really what that is is when you're thinking about the funding, kids have many kinds of needs. But for the funding purposes, even if you are an English learner who is low income and foster, you're only going to count one time. We are a community-based, uh, community-funded basic aid district. And so what that means for community-funded districts is there's no additional state funding, but we still have the requirements. And so we're still going to meet those obligations, but we don't see extra funds come through the way other districts do. So we are community-funded, and we're so proud of that and the amazing work that, um, that our communities do to support us. A reminder that our local control accountability plan is for all students and especially the kids with the greatest needs. And so we really, really conceptualize our local control accountability plan to think about everyone. It talks about goals, intended outcomes, our actions and services, and really it's designed with a reflection of the state priorities that are required of us. There are many components to the local control and accountability plan. There's a parent budget overview. It's a three-page document with a mandated template. Then we have the draft uh, currently posted on the website. It's coming in at 100 pages, so we're really excited about paring it down. <laughs> One time it was 356, but who's counting? At the very end, there are planned expenditures and um, annual update action uh, tables. And so that really lays out very clearly um, the funding. Um, so you don't have to search throughout the document. You get to see uh, the goal, the action number, a short title, and then the different kinds of funding sources. So the components of the LCAP are a budget overview and then a plan summary, including our reflections, um, specifically on some successes and identified needs, and then also some of our LCAP highlights, um, the uh, engagement partners and get, uh, with educational partners that we went through in terms of the process, the feedback, and how it influenced our LCAP. Then we have the goals and actions, um, and then an essay towards the end about the increased and improved services with the supplemental funding action tables, and then we're required to include the uh, instructions from the state, but we are allowed to change the font. <laughs> <laughs> so the budget overview for parents, it's a three-page document, again, and it's supposed to simplify uh, what the funding looks like. You can debate whether it's actually as simplified, but really what you're looking at is the federal funds are the yellow, there's other local funds that are green, and then the uh, orange pie is other state funds. Those are one set of buckets, and then they have the total LCFF funds, which is really those uh, other funds that are general fund and what's considered supplemental. Then the other darker blue is representing the supplemental or concentration grant, and then uh, the general fund. Um, so really that's what you're looking at here. At the very bottom you see about 19400000 is what would be our supplemental funding. 
Um, but at the very bottom in tiny print, what you'll see is that our district is actually um, spending uh, more, it was, we're going to be spending more than that. So 19404, that would be the number um, that we would be targeting. Then the purpose of this is to, to again really show an <coughs> overall of the total budget as well as what is in the LCAP. And so the total budget is not what you're going to see in the LCAP. That's what you're going to see in a 556-ish page document from this team over here. So if you wanted to see the all funds budget, then you could see that. The, the LCAP, though, is really addressing things that are a little bit closer to the action in terms of instruction and um, the whole child. And then the third page is a overview of the 22-23 school year, and that's where it shows what was budgeted for students with high needs, or that supplemental dollar, and then what we actually spent. And so what you'll notice here is that we budgeted about $15 million of the supplemental funding, but in reality, we spent $20 million. And the reason is because when we took a hard look at what we were doing, transitional kindergarten can fall under our obligation for local control funding formula. And so we really felt like it was important to capitalize on that, and that's why you see that we are well over the target. So next in our agenda is to talk about successes. And one of the things that we want to highlight is the board priorities and how tightly we have aligned our LCAP to the board priorities um, of increasing academic achievement to the 2019 levels, really expanding our whole child support, meaningfully communicating with constituents, and developing our maintenance and facility master plans. So the three areas that we want to highlight, even though we could highlight many more, in our LCAP are about that support for student and family wellness, the academic support for students, and then particularly our elementary early and expanded learning opportunities. So in terms of support for student and family wellness, one of the things that we are really proud of is our programs and our services, and particularly our staffing. We have such amazing staff, both certificated and classified. And so you see that we've put a lot of effort into maintaining physical health and um, serving all our students with special needs, and then also um, behavior and mental health. So really thinking about secondary school counseling, elementary school counseling, as was mentioned earlier, our social workers, our behavior specialists, and then, of course, thinking about student safety when they're not in class, student supervision, and really thinking about some partnerships to make sure that kids are supervised um, to the extent possible. So our 11 elementary counselors we're so proud of, and we're also so very proud that we're going to be able to expand to all of the elementary schools next year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We also have additional support in terms of social workers and behavior specialists and um, the district elected to expand health assistant hours years ago and has maintained and preserved that. And so we're really proud of the maintenance of that as well as thinking about how to effectively deploy the staff we have. And so we are redeploying our social workers and behavior specialists in different ways to be a little bit more targeted and to make sure that we're focusing on especially some of the neediest kids and some of the, um, the more challenging behaviors. And then we had a wellness team model that we were speaking about last year and really thinking about all the different players and how they work together. And we're very proud of the work that was done on our campuses. We also recognize the need to um, define roles and responsibilities and be as smooth and efficient as possible. So we're going to be streamlining the work of the wellness team into the student study team model that many people are familiar with um, throughout the country and throughout the state. And so we're keeping wellness, but we're really putting it into a study team system that people are familiar with and can be very clear and concise. On to academics. So one of the things I hope that you see here is the significant amount of fiscal and personnel impact that you have, um, have on our kids. We have so many specialists, coaches, um, teachers on special assignment, and um, interventionists, and full-time and support-time teachers. And it's so powerful to supplement and augment the amazing instruction that's happening day to day from our teachers of record. So we're really proud of the music and the um, science and the um, PE specialists. We're proud of all the extra work. But we're also particularly proud of the elementary support teachers that we've been able to hide, hide, hire. <laughs> because they are incredibly um, gifted assets. And because they're not necessarily assigned to a classroom, we've really been able, able to leverage professional development for them. Because as we said many times, one of our challenges is substitute teachers and having enough subs to release teachers for professional learning. But because we have these full-time support teachers, we have been able to train them to be highly skilled in the science of reading. They've been instrumental in supporting us with uh, phonemic awareness and phonics. Um, we've had a really great initiative to support all of our K-1-2 teachers.
teachers and really understanding the science of reading, practical things that they can do to make sure that all kids are reading fluently, and then eliciting and responding to student thinking as a theme and particularly guiding the work of our secondary team. We have also invested significantly in credit recovery intervention in our summer programs. We're trying to give kids every opportunity who may have been uh, lost in their little bit of their learning to accelerate and then to stay on track and remediate whatever they need to so that they can graduate on time. We've also put in together a secondary administrative um, intern model, as well as maintaining our instructional coaches on campuses. And we think all of those pieces together are going to help maintain our already elevated graduation rate, which we still want to be higher. We're not quite where we want to be, but we definitely have gotten back from a, a, a pandemic slump. So we talked a little bit about academic success, but one of the things that we really want to make sure we highlight is that you, the board, charged us with sharing uh, our academic progress and a lot of progress um, throughout our organization at every single board meeting. And so we wanted to highlight that some of these things have been shared with you. Our amazing career technical education program. We had a learning acceleration presentation in February. We had advancement via individual determination in May. We've shared our summer programs. That was way back in September. And so many of the things that you're hearing and seeing in the LCAP are not surprises. They should echo from wonderful memories past of all of these <laughs> wonderful presentations because so many great things have been done. And then lastly, as our third success that we wanted to highlight, our elementary uh, early and expanded learning opportunities. We're so pleased uh, about the strong start in Newport Mesa. We talked a little bit about those full-time support teachers and about some of the professional <coughs> learning that's gone on. But really, this presentation that was um, pre presented to you uh, in March focused on P3, preschool through third grade alignment, and the work that is so critical in making sure that we're articulating upwards and also really focusing on a joyful learning experience for our littles. So we're proud of the work that we're doing in recognition of that. We're proud of looking at learning environments in our transitional kindergarten and our kindergarten classes. And then we also are proud of the results. So um, we shared at that meeting, and I think it's worth repeating, that our kinder students, um, in particular, are flourishing. And first and second grade, too, they have a little catching up to do. But our kindergarten, in particular, is just doing so well. We're exceeding benchmarks. We're doing better, often, than some of the pre-pandemic numbers. And we really think it's um, due to a lot of these efforts aligning. And then our expanded learning. Um, our expanded learning programs, and this is a beautiful graphic that Kathleen uh, Leary put together, really shows you how expanded learning is not just after school and is not just summer, but it is also before school, and it is also tutoring, and it is also partnerships, it is also enrichment. And all of those pieces together, where parents have a lot of choice in the different programs that their kids can participate, is um, something that we're extremely proud of. And so engaging our educational partners, this used to be called stakeholder engagement, but um, if you hear the latest lingo, it's in educational partners. And so one of the things that we just really want to highlight is we've chosen to really lean into our student voice and their student focus groups. And it's been so wonderful to have that communication with the kids and understand what's working and how, where can we go next. So we've uh, turned to um, sixth grade, eighth grade, and 12th grade focus groups, key times where the kids are um, transitioning to an another grade level. Um, we asked them the questions, what helped you in school? What would you change to make it even better? What advice would you give to next year's kids? What are you excited about? Um, and so we really want to get that opportunity to hear from the kids. We go out in teams of two, um, different people from the district office, so we can also have the benefit of hearing from these amazing kiddos. So I'm just going to highlight what helped and some suggestions in a Wordle. And so um, you can see a word cloud. Um, some of the things that we're, um, are, we're re recognizing are the relationships the relationships the kids have to one another, the relationships they have to their teachers, to their school, and to all of the different things that help them, particularly enrichment and um, some of the, the programs on campuses. Um, but again, you can see it all over there. Relationships, relationships, um, play, joy, help. And then you also notice that some of the similar things are relationships in terms of what would make things better, but then also some of the things about learning environment. Yes, see how big food is? <laughs> so we understand. <laughs> they want more lunch time. They want us to think about the bathrooms. And so we understand and we hear from them and, and we do um, really uh, hear from, from the kiddos about the things of their learning environment and their relationships and we recognize their voices. 
We also have forums. We have a, a PM employee forum, so everybody can participate. We do everything through Zoom. We have a morning and an afternoon forum, and it is in March, and it'll be in March next year, so everybody mark your calendars. It's an awesome experience. It's very respectful. It's two-way. People share lots of great ideas, some that are often in opposition, but that's okay because we're here to listen. And we really just ask questions around our main goals of our uh, local control and accountability plan, and the questions are successes and suggestions. Very simple. And it is, of course, in English and Spanish. So um, school and district groups also, we um, reach out through all of the schools to gather input. And so this is part of the school planning process. The same questions um, that we're asking about the LCAP, we're asking schools to ask of their own planning process because their goals are our goals. The school plan mirrors the local control, uh, local control and accountability plan because guess who's in charge of the school plans? So the school leadership teams, English learner advisories, school site council, all of them give input annually. And then our parent and family um, community advisory, our English learner advisory, our DLAC, um, our superintendent's parent advisory, and then of course our bargaining units partner with us, and lastly our SELPA. So all of this input is gathered and then we look at it and you can see quite a bit of it included and summarized in the beginning of our LCAP. We also do a survey. Please mark your calendars for next January because we want more people to take the survey. <laughs> so you'll notice that we have about 2,322 people who took the survey. It's not our high, but it's also not our low. So next year we're hoping to at least double. And then a great number uh, of our staff took it, but again, not our high, not our low, so we're looking to do better next year. And so this is not all of the input, but really we wanted to focus on a few things people were sharing is just the additional staffing is appreciated. People have recognized the work that, that folks have been doing, and then also thinking about how can we be targeted, especially around student behavior. Lots of student behavior is great, but then some of the um, egregious behavior is noticed. So we're really trying to figure out what are the best ways to, to manage that. And then again, clarifying and streamlining roles and responsibilities. And then thinking about our tier one academics, making sure we have that solid foundation, and also a recognition of the appreciation for the amazing professional development that's been offered. And then um, in recognition of the after school programs, continue them, expand them, and then lastly, make sure that families have information about career and college planning. So all of those things are in the works. Also, people are very interested in our class sizes and thinking about staffing, and then just looking at safety and thinking about um, especially um, the administrative support that might be necessary to support our special ed programs. And then uh, on the parent and family uh, engagement, really thinking about adolescent development and as was mentioned earlier, helping families work with their own kids at home. And then thinking about our communication processes, especially how many systems we may have and how can we be streamlined and clear. So those are the four goals. They're not quite the same numbers as the board priorities, but almost. They all work in concert. And really, um, we're proud of our plan in that it focuses on a tiered approach. And that is really thinking about all kids, some kids, and few kids. And you'll notice throughout the structure of our um, LCAP, that's what is highlighted. We also have a short version, so if you don't want to read 99 pages, you can read four. <laughs> the four goals are listed here. We have new items in red each year. Many of the things that we have in here are not new because we've been doing them and building over time. So we have lots of systems in place at the tier one level in each of the areas, um, positive behavior, restorative practices. One of the things that we're really leaning into next year is attendance. Attendance? attendance. Mm -hmm. And on our California school dashboard, you'll hear more about it next week in our local indicators, but one of the areas that Newport Mesa is challenged is in chronic absenteeism. Every single student group in this district is either high or very high in chronic absenteeism as a group, and so that's something that we really want to address. And so at the very tier one level, just having some messaging, making sure that everybody understands why attendance is important, um, and then also just thinking about um, the ways that we're thinking about physical health and safety. We had the student academic success and some of the things around our staffing, some of the programs that we have. Also, we want to highlight that we're hiring floater teacher teams. Remember we mentioned the sub shortage? Well, we have a solution. And the solution is to get in-house people who are quality teachers to stand in while our teachers are going to training and then coming back and our teachers can pick up with the learning right where they left off. So we're going to work with that. And um, we've done a, a creative blend of um, educator effectiveness dollars to make that work. And we think that investment is going to pay off very well. And that's something that will serve all of our kids. So I invite everyone to really take a look at our approach to all, some, and few. Again, you can read the draft on the website. You also have the short version available in English and Spanish.
And um, I do want to highlight we're also extremely excited about the addition of six positions for our school community facilitators. We were at 22, we're at 28. We want to get fully staffed, but we really recognize the impact that they have um, on our campuses. We're also excited to increase from one to two district translators. Javier is madly interpreting out there. I'm a fast talker. Um, but he also it translates all of our LCAP documents, and it is not an easy task. No one's probably happier than him that we've gone down to 99 pages. <laughs> And then lastly, we have some things for a few of our kids when they're um, challenged or if they're in a smaller group with specific needs. And so um, those are all listed as our third part of the uh, short version. There are measurements and results in our local control accountability plan and they build over time. One of the challenges in the timing of this plan is that we have to give it to you before the year is done. So you'll see a lot of lags and we indicate what year each of the pieces is from so you can see um, where we're getting our data. And then in terms of the actions, what you'll notice is that they're just structured so that you have an action, the title, a little description, the total funding, and whether it contributes or not to our supplemental funding. The action tables at the end will give you a lot more detail. So the all some few, just want to make sure people see the connection between the short version, the long version, and the structures of our goals. And then at the end, we have the increased or improved services, and this is where we talk about that 19 million, or in our cases, it was $20 million for next year, 23. So um, that what are, what are we doing with that money? How, do we, uh, how did we decide? What do we think it's going to impact? How are we going to measure it? So that essay at the end, you'll be able to look at those increased or improved services. And then lastly, the expenditure tables. Um, they have the total planned expenditures, what contributes to supplemental, and then you'll have the uh, carryover table. Remember, we had none because we spent more than they gave us. And then um, lastly, we just want to point out that we have an intentional integration of many different funding sources and plans from the A, A to G block grant to educator effectiveness, our expanded learning opportunities program, the LCAP federal addendum, which will be up for your approval next week, and then the learning recovery emergency block grant. We put all of those funds together. We want to show a comprehensive picture of the program that we're providing for your children. Where can you find the LCAP? I know you're dying to find it. <laughs> It's on our website. I'm ready. It's in the first tab in about. Remember, hey, look, attendance matters. <laughs> about. It's under district plans. And then it's the very top local control and accountability plan. And so the, the newest documents are there. If you want to see older documents, go down about five tabs. And it says um, prior plans, I believe. And then under that, we have LCAPs going back to the dawn of time. And lastly, do you have any questions? Yes, Trustee Barto. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the report. Um, I noticed the attendance matters popping up um, towards the last couple weeks of school, and I uh, used that with my own kids, and they asked why. So um, I have uh, plenty of reasons if you need some backup for that marketing campaign. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but se seriously, I, I was wondering with the word cloud, one of them ones I saw was food. Were they, do you know, like, were they talking about, like, quantity, quality, or is it like that they, they enjoyed having more class parties? Like, that could be such a broad um, meaning. Having read their feedback, it is not about quantity, and it's not about parties. So um, they're, they're interested in going back to having more of the food options that they had pre-pandemic, which I understand is a real challenge given mm -hmm. some of the staffing. Yeah. And some of the, mm -hmm. Okay. So. Thank you. Trustee Murphy. Oh, yeah, I just, um, yes, thank you for all of this. Clearly a lot of hard work. Great job. Um, I, I'm i sure I'll ask Jeff later about how he feels about going over budget. I'm sure he was Five loving million. all he of knew. that. He <laughs> knew. Loving all of that. I'm surprised he's sitting here upright. Um, but just wanted a little more clarity by what you meant by some and few. Who? What does that mean? Because then at the end you get to the segmented populations so mm -hmm. so when we're thinking about tiers one two and three usually what happens is you're thinking about what's your core instructional program what's something that you're going to offer to all kids and then in an academic sense if they're struggling then it might be the struggling kids often it would be like an English learner right because the language is a challenge sometimes it could be students with um, just they didn't pick up the the content the first time um, sometimes student groups end up having a lot of struggle and so they're not in tier two because of or student group, but because of the challenges that they've had. 
So we're really looking at the tiered supports. But then some of the things that we're doing are for a very small group of students. So for instance, newcomer English learners. We're mm -hmm. going to provide a very different kind of targeted support for that small group for a small amount of time, hopefully about a year, a year and a half, of really intensive support. So we're really thinking about all the things that we'd want for a newcomer. They still need music. They still need PE, we're going to give them all. And then if they're having challenges in reading, then we're going to give them the next dose and then the next dose until we can figure out what to do to meet the kids where they are. Thank you, that helps. And then um, as with the word cloud, I saw um, bathrooms on there. So what, what exactly about the bathrooms should we be well, doing? Um, so it kind of depends on the school. <laughs> it kind of depends, depends on the school and the grade level. And so um, they presented different challenges, some thinking about supervision, some thinking about access, them some thinking about perhaps the time of day they ran into a, there wasn't toilet paper at the time. So it depends on the, like, like many places, it depends on the situation, it depended on the time of day. Thank you. But trust me, everybody who got the focus groups, all those principals get the feedback. And so the school teams are aware of the feedback that has been shared with them. That is specific to their school. That is specific That's to great. their school. Okay. Yeah, great. Because, you know, there are some schools who didn't mention a bathroom at all. Fabulous. <laughs> yes. Thank you. We have great bathrooms. Trustee Wagon. Um, thank you. This is very in depth. Can't wait to read more. Um, but you did, you did mention something about fill in teachers because we have staffing shortages trying to find subs. Um, and then can you explain a little bit more about that and then the funding source that's, mm -hmm. that's around that? Sure. So they're, um, we're calling it the floater teachers. Floater so we've teachers. had a floater teacher model for a while, actually. We, okay. we needed a couple of special ed floaters. And then um, kind of right post-pandemic, we needed some people specifically in math and science, those hard-to-fill areas. So having someone on retainer helps us not have to wait for random people to come through. Mm -hmm. Also, that helps us guide on the philosophy that we have in terms of um, our instructional approach about positive behavior mm -hmm. and support and really thinking about some restorative practices, thinking about naming our emotions and trying to regulate them. So um, we have that ability to support them with also uh, and some of our instructional practices. So it gives us a sure thing because we just have not had enough people to be able to count on if you've got 15 people who you need for your, your training and then you can only send seven. Now, now you have to make up the train for someone else. So what we're trying to do is build in dependability and quality at the same time. So what, what's the quantity of those? That we're uh, 12, Twelve coming up. We okay. had uh, 10 positions this year uh, towards the end of the year. We started this model, I think, around March. And um, Educator Effectiveness Block Grant, I think it's roughly about $5 million-ish, and we brought okay. the plan to you about a year ago. Okay. And so if you look at the original plan, it's not included, but it's something that has evolved. And um, we really think it's going to be very powerful. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Trustee Crane. Yeah, to piggyback off of uh, Trustee Wigan's question, question about elementary support teachers, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I had a question, are those our floaters? So the answer is yes. Oh, sorry, no, there's 12 floaters, and then we have the, um, the, the full-time support teachers. There are 22 for the district for everybody, and then mm -hmm. there's additional 10 funded out of district uh, Title I. So um, we're really trying to make sure we're doubling down at our Title I schools that have the highest concentrations of poverty. So would an example be, for example, uh, let's say uh, East Bluff Elementary has a, uh, a lot of newcomers that are coming into the, to the school site, so you deploy a support teacher to go help the classroom teacher. Would that be an, an example? Yep, there's already a support teacher yeah. on that campus as I've well as a, as a part-time hourly, and then they also have an additional instructional assistant who's okay. focusing on the newcomers over at East Bluff. So that helps in the context of explaining what this is. That's, yes. that's great, it's yes. wonderful for the classroom teacher as well yes. and the kids. Good, thank, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I have some questions, but I wanted to let you go. Yes, Trustee Craig. I wanted to add one more thing. Um, I saw, as part of the explanations under ac academic support and professional development, um, the science of reading. I yes. have been, I've had the, the pleasure of hearing some great feedback about this program. Uh -huh. One principal couldn't stop talking about it. So <laughs> thank you for doing that and providing it for our, our uh, teachers and principals. Well, you know, I should have mentioned earlier, but it, it takes a village to raise an LCAP. And so we have uh, so much great leadership happening between our assistant soups and the hiring that's been done. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have some amazing directors who have really been working to cultivate this vision. And so um, Dr. Lori Hernandez and Kathleen Leary in particular have really guided this vision around the science of reading since well before the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, in Kathleen's case, and then uh, Lori's case recently, because she was only hired two years ago. Um, but we 
um, we embarked on this journey of really trying to do this training, um, and I should have highlighted our inclusive practices um, because we really are doing the very best that we can to include kids in a gen ed setting whenever possible. Mm -hmm. And so not only are our full-time support teachers getting this training, but many of our um, SAI, our specialized academic instruction teachers, they are also doing it alongside. And next year, all of them are going into year two, and I believe we have 30 four maybe, uh, first grade teachers who are interested in joining on for next year. Wow. Yes, and because we have the floater team, we are able to provide that training. Mm -hmm. So um, it's actually, letters is the acronym. I was just looking because I'm good at the acronym game, but I think I've forgotten that one, but it's about literacy, instruction, and spelling. Um, so um, it's, it's very well regarded. It's based on the work of Louisa Motes, and um, if you've read anything about the scores in Mississippi, we want to do even better. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anderson. That was one of my items because I've been trained in that and I was like, we've always needed Sorry. this. So thank yeah. you so much. I think one of the things that I heard this year from um, one of the intervention teachers at Wilson was that all of her kids were at grade level. Mm -hmm. So for starting that's kindergarten amazing. at grade level, yeah. we're starting from a really wonderful place and that's so exciting to hear. Um, I was wondering about, I know we were doing one before school kind of pilot. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any plans to expand or add one or two campuses? Um, I know that we were working at Whittier. I'm looking back to Chris, uh, Kathleen Leary about uh, the question <laughs> about before school and the, the before school care. We're continuing at Whittier. Continuing at Whittier. Okay. One of the comments I'd heard from a lot of College Park parents particularly was that there's a desire. Okay. And I think at a few other schools, but you know, I believe at Mariners at one point there was. Um, and then I was wondering for the student focus groups, um, I'm glad to hear that the principals are getting that feedback information. I think it would also be helpful for us. I would love to know, particularly, I think you know, we all represent different areas, but I think it's also great to hear what's happening or what students are thinking. So if it would be possible to email all of us that data, that would be really wonderful. Um, and I'll, then- I'll work with Socorro to, um, to get you what you need. Wonderful thing. And I was looking, so we are on year three. We are embarking of, upon year three, yes. And then do what does the process look like for changing? Because I know, you know, we talked mm -hmm. in year, I think it was four years ago, when we, we added in family and community engagement as a fourth goal. Um, and now I think we've far surpassed some of the measurables, and they're not as community-focused or not, you know, they're kind of... Um, they're in that sphere, but I think there's a lot more that we could add. Do we start planning, like what, like in we start October? start planning on June 21st after you okay. approve this LCAP. Okay. <laughs> and then what does that process look like? Because we've been doing, you know, these measurables for mm -hmm. the past three years. So when we would change, you know, um, measuring, I think, where did it go? Uh, measuring a family activity night like do we like it doesn't have a number attached to it it doesn't have a specific thing so how do, how do we make those changes and who decides so it's a great question we all do and so in working with Socorro as we look on the next horizon of what's to come um, part of what we need to know from the state is are they going to change this the template drastically or are they going to change the requirements drastically mm -hmm. um, we also need to take a good long look at what is this information told, told us and then what are the things that we still need to continue to um, to add and then what are the things that belong in an LCAP versus what are the things that belong more at a local level um, but the, the state has not released uh, any of their information about a new template. Um, so the only thing that I know is on the horizon is they're looking at doing a mid-year update again. <laughs> yes, I, I know they like to throw these things at you. Yes. Um, okay, well, that's good to hear because I, I just think there's a lot more that we can do that adds specificity to mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. of those items. I think that is it for me. Okay. All right. right. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Next, we have number 20, legislative and state budget items. Trustee Murphy and Trustee Bartow. Do you have any items you would like to discuss? Michelle Murphy's gonna read the budget update and then I've got some updates from 
uh, CSBA's legislative committee. I uh, guess we um, brief. Some of you all may know um, the budget was recently uh, released. The state's budget, um, identical versions, AB 101, SB 101. Um, the governor and the legislature have almost come to agreement on it. They will be voting, um, the legislature will be voting on the budget bill on the 15th. Um, what is in there regarding education is an agreement on the 8.22% COLA for LCFF and specified categorical programs, including special education. The budget bills include roughly 300 million for the LCFF equity multiplier, and we expect trailer bill language to be similar to the governor's May revision proposal, uh, which is good. We'll see how it goes. Um, there's also agreement on additional funding for the cost of universal school meals and 80 million for county offices of ed that operate county juvenile court and community schools, which is great. The community schools funding actually was increased this year, which was sort of a surprise, but is great for um, districts that need it. The main differences stem from the legislature, legislature adopting a prop adopting a Proposition 98 guarantee that is 2.1 billion higher compared to the May revision. That's a problem. Uh, based on an assumption that the higher local property tax revenue increases the Proposition 98 guarantee. This allows the legislature to eliminate most of the cuts to the one-time block grants proposed by the administration. Instead of a $1.8 billion cut to arts, music, and instructional materials block grant, the current budget bill proposes only a $200 million reduction, which is great. Um, there will be a lot of uh, school communities in Newport Mesa that will be very happy to hear that, though so I'm still not happy about a $200 million reduction. Instead of a $2.5 billion cut to the Learning Recovery Emergency Block Grant, the legislature proposes a reduction of about $500 million. We will need to wait and see what comes out of the negotiations with the governor before we have clarity on the amount of these cuts of these one-time block grants. So it's a little bit better than um, it could have been. It's not great still. Um, so uh, as I keep telling uh, my colleagues in my work life, pay your taxes, everybody. <laughs> all I have to say about that. <laughs> Um, um, so additionally, I was able to meet with some um, delegates from CSBA and got to hear from the legislative analyst's office. And um, additionally, they wanted to thank all of you trustees for your advocacy. So many times we feel like we make comments and um, advocate with our assemblymen and senators and we it falls on deaf ears. Um, one, you'll all remember, one big push from CSBA was to advocate for not cutting the arts and music and instructional materials block grant, but instead taking that from um, another area. And that is somewhere that it was really heard. Um, one area that was not going to be cut and was substituted, so that's a good thing, is there was a budget item which would have afforded one time money to uh, high school seniors to visit um, museums. It provided free museum passes, which is a really nice to have, but it doesn't um, really solve the problem of school districts who've already spent a lot of this um, money and distributed money based on promises that that's what they'll have to spend. So that, uh, I think you guys will recall, we specifically asked if maybe that could be cut instead of the, the we'll just call it the IM block grant. Um, and, th and that happened. So, so I, I, I'm excited because so rarely we make these pushes. We, we make these pushes and nothing happens. Is usually the case. So it was very nice to um, see the fruits of our labors um, be heard. And we have. It, uh, we would love that it had been cut at all, but um, it could have been. It was initially projected to, uh, yeah, be a 1.8 billion dollar cut instead of a 200 million dollar cut. So um, good news for for all students in that way. Um, Additionally, we heard from the legislative analyst office and they kind of took a look at the future. They look at uh, taxes um, withholdings. So um, what they project into the future is that uh, 20, and they're usually, you know, they're not always right, but they're, they're usually pretty close. Um, 23, 24 is gonna be a bit of a recovery, 25 as well. And then they think that uh, everything will kind of stabilize with funding. It'll be less of a um, cliff and 
uh, you know, feast or famine situation um, starting in 25, 26 <coughs> school year. So uh, that's helpful for us. We can plan for that. Uh, some other school districts I was talking to though, it's very, very stressful that they're looking at the next three years uh, for a, a deficit, um, a big, big, big deficit. So um, it's nice to hear that we can, I'm sure Jeff, would, <laughs> you'd prefer that that wasn't the case, but uh, they, they think that three years, if so, we can figure that out for the next three years. That's um, a good thing to shoot for. Um, there were several bills that CSBA had us review, they put on their, I'm gonna turn off my sound on my computer. Um, but they, we see it in other school districts, um, but the teacher shortage is a real thing, and we talked about it with substitute teachers. There's several bills um, that are in uh, the legislature to kind of address that, and there's two that CSBA um, specifically sponsored. Uh, one of them, they, they support, not sponsor. Um, AB 238 is a California Student Teacher Support Grant Program, and AB 672 is Teacher Credentialing, Teacher Credentialing ta Task Force, and then there's another bill which would allow for, it's specifically targeted towards military spouses, but if you have a credential in another state, um, you're eligible to teach here as long as you get your California credential within a year, so those are just some that are focused on that. Um, additionally, there's uh, AB 1283, which is uh, addressing um, an emergency stock of albuterol inhalers. If you've ever had a child with asthma, it's pretty scary if they don't have that inhaler. So that would be uh, implemented at schools across California. Um, then there's additional funding for pupil health, social, emotional, behavior, mental health supports, and supporting um, additional uh, counselors through the mental health workforce in AB 921. And there's a few more, but I think those are the most relevant to our district specifically. I could go on for a while, there's, there's quite a few. So um, <laughs> anyways, that's, that's the part of my report, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we will move on to item number 21, the consent calendar. Do you have a motion? So moved. Second. Yes. Okay, moved by Trustee Wigan, seconded by Trustee Crane. Can, can, I, vote? can I add a, a couple comments? Sure. Um, there were, I wanted to ask if I could get, uh, in the future, the for 21B, the social studies um, framework training through Orange County Department of Education, if um, we could see kind of what that entails specifically. And then I'm, I'm happy to approve it. I know that we need it, but I'd like to know just for the future what that entails. And then, um, I answered my question on the other one, so it's just 21B. 21B1. Um, 21 yes. Trustee Barto, can you clarify again what, what you, the, the first so part? Of we're approving the proposal from Orange County Department of Education to provide history, social science framework training for secondary teachers. Um, and I looked at the proposal and it is, does provide lots of references, but I would just like any additional information um, in the future after that, after that's completed. That we could be, that we could see. Okay. Roll call vote. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Wigan. Yes. Trustee Pearson. Yes. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Ursoilu. Trustee Bartow. Yes. Next public hearing for the local control and accountability plan. So uh, as par for the course of the LCAP plan, we had that detailed report from Vanessa Gailey. We do open it up for public hearing. All right. The public hearing is now open at 814 and there are no speaker cards submitted for comment. So the public hearing is now closed at 814. <laughs> And then next up, um, we also have the public hearing for the 2023 All Funds Final Budget. Did you? All right, hello, Mr. Trader. So we will open up the public hearing at 814 for the budget, and there are no speaker cards submitted for comments.
And are you going to do, okay, perfect. It's not on my list, so thank you. <clears throat> so it's great to be with you tonight. Um, I have to tell you, uh, working with uh, Vanessa Gailey and her staff and Ed Services, that's one of the great things that is really well oiled and, and really works well. So we're really appreciative of her and all of the effort and how closely that we work together. So let's uh, let's talk about um, let's talk about <clears throat> the budget mandate. We have to adopt a budget by June thirtieth, and we will make revisions to that budget in first and second interim. And then this is the budget, or I say the budget process that the state follows when they adopt a budget. And usually, the the May revised budget is um, pretty much what gets adopted here in June. However, as Trustee Murphy said, there is some good, well, better news. Maybe not good news, but better news that we found out yesterday. And we'll cover that a little bit later on here. But let's talk first about um, the economy. You know, normally we, we don't spend your time prognosticating on the economy. But this slide and the next slide are the opening acts for the star of our show, slide 14. <laughs> and, and I promise you, uh, slide 14 will be activating. Get out your, uh, your cell phone flashlights or your lighters, whatever you Ready. use. But, um, no, lighter. it, it, no lighters. Um, <clears throat> but it, I promise you it will be activating. It will be wonderful. Um, so this is an interesting slide. When you look at this slide, this is kind of fascinating. This slide compares... Uh, three western states, California, Oregon, and Washington, right? Now, <clears throat> this illustrates why California uh -huh. experiences economic changes differently than, say, other states. So here, you see California, right? Its uh, unemployment rate is going up. Everybody else is going down. We are an outlier. We are high risk, high reward when it comes to the economy. And, and that's, that's important context for us to know here in this room as we make decisions. Now, um, you know, it's interesting. I was at, uh, there was a couple of high school students and they were talking. And it was one, one girl, she was saying, you know, I was so sleepy the other day. <laughs> I, I flipped a coin. I tossed a coin to see if I was going to go to school or not. And her friend looked at her and said, and it's mouth. Really? And it's <laughs> what happened? And she said, you know, her friend responded, she said, you know, I had to flip that darn coin ten times before I could go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and the, 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 uh, this reminds me because the UCLA um, uh, School of Management, uh, no offense to USC, but they, <laughs> they have for the third time in a row put out an economic um, pro, uh, prognosis for uh, the third quarter, of it, it's a basically a flip of a coin. 50-50 if we're going to be in a recession or slow growth in the third quarter of this year. So um, we know that California, how we experience things more acutely, so slow growth, recession, not really good options really at all there. So think about that in mind. So when we get to slide 14, and, and this is what's happening here, we see that the revenue, right, Prop 98 revenue is falling. It's falling dramatically by billions and billions of dollars. Even when you think about the, from the January budget to the May revise, the revenues went down over $10 billion. That's a real, that's a, a dramatic swing. So when you look at this here, we have, here's the, the governor's budget, right? You see the drop there. Here we have the May revise, even more drop, and this is where we started. So we're experiencing some significant uh, reductions in revenues. Important for you as trustees to understand. And so, but let's look at the budget highlights. So some of these were covered by uh, Trustee Murphy. You know, Universal Mills, really favorable for us. ELOP, super favorable for us. Facilities, favorable. Prop 28, community schools, and then an 8.22% COLA. All really good news. And, and these things all help Newport Mesa Unified. Now the unfavorable things that Trustee Murphy uh, covered was the art and music and the learning recovery block grant. Now, at the May revise, 
those two represented an $11.3 million reduction to us. Since yesterday, cross our fingers that the governor signs it, but that reduction's been cut from 11.3 million to about three and a half million for us. So uh, not good news, but better news, right? Um, in that regard. So we're, we're happy about that. But let's talk about, let's talk about some district factors here. So you have added, now recall, we had a budget study session, right? A little while ago. And in that budget study session, uh, you gave us encouragement, or let's just say direction, to do some things. And we did these things. These are significant budget ads. But what's really cool about this, it's budget neutral. These were balanced with uh, uh, new revenues and with refinements. And so this is, for, for like a, a, a guy like me, this is wonderful. So when you think of that science camp core added, elementary field trip core added, LCFF supplemental, we're overfunding that, right? Um, site support. Um, safety, uh, universal transitional kindergarten, that's adding a whole new grade level, preschool assessment, and elementary counselors. All significant adds uh, to the budget at uh, neutral. 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 No, no adding to the deficit. So enrollment is uh, still slightly declining. Um, however, the, the rate of decline is decreasing. So, and this is caused you know, by the uh, rate of births and migration. And so perhaps if you could deploy your um, Board of Education superpowers and get us more babies, that would be helpful. <laughs> um, pension costs are driving, uh, uh, here's the total pension cost, right, rolling up. But here's the more important thing. When you look at this, how much do pensions uh, consume of our budget? And in 2013-14, they consumed about 5.5%. In 23 24, pensions are going to consume 11.5% of our budget. And then the out years, they'll get, it'll get to 12%. So then let's take a look at our revenue. And, and uh, Trustee Bartow mentioned the three years. The three years. So if you look at this chart, this is interesting. Our revenue peaks in 22-23, and we don't get to that revenue, that same revenue, until 25-26. So take a deep breath, and what does that mean? That means that uh, expense is gonna flatten. We, we just have no choice. We gotta flatten that curve, and so you see there our expense, we have the little trough there, and we're gonna flatten that out. And so let's talk about, and same thing, we have in a revenue expense use alignment challenge. And so when you look at this, this revenue line, you know, that's a wonderful line until we get to that trough there for the next three years, right? The, the challenging three. And then, um, and then we get the, the expense line. And, and you can see there, there's a little bit of a deviation. And uh, we're, we're, we're challenged there to, to keep that red line below the green line. And so let's talk, here we are, the star of the show, financial activators. So um, a little while ago, Dr. Smith uh, encouraged us, gave us direction to come up with financial activators. You know, or in other words, thresholds that would, when, when, um, when breached would create some sort of action, right? And so we did, we came up with those activators and so we see here, so on the left-hand side is the actual, that's the metric. And you see there, there's thresholds, right? And the green is favorable, the, the gray is acceptable, and the kind of the pink is evaluate, right? And so you see those on the left-hand side. Then on the right-hand side, you see the results. Now, when you're looking at this, you think, hmm, what is happening here? So in 23-24, our unrestricted general fund is going to have a change and it's going to be a net negative $200,000. Not too worried about that at all. That's a, on a spend every dollar budget. That's, you know, we're, we're probably okay there, right? But look at 2526. We have a negative $5.9 million change in the general fund. Now, we knew this was going to happen. Um, we planned for it. Uh, and and 5.9 million is not 
not a whole lot. It's, it's essentially 2% of the unrestricted general fund or about 1% of the total general fund, right? But 5.9 million, you know, once, twice, you know, and then after a while we start getting, you know, to, to real money, right? And then, then that's a, you know, a trip to fiscal, fiscal scary farm and maybe a fast pass to a ride we don't want to be on kind of thing. So we, we do have to take care of it, right? We do have to, like, look and, and, and think about, you know, what we're going to do. And, and so what does that mean for us? That means we're going to be focusing on the, the vital few, not the trivial many, it means we're looking at different ways to provide service. It means that we're going to be looking at a, uh, an across-the-board 2% savings that we're going to have to make, 2% savings. We're going to save 2% um, across the board. And, and you know, that's a, uh, that's, a, that's a formidable challenge. You know, I, I think it might be easier to, um, to uh, convince Dr. Smith to wear a necktie outside of a board meeting. You know, it's going to be kind of impossible. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, it's going to be a formidable challenge, but I'm confident we're up to the challenge in that regard. Um, and so with that, uh, <clears throat> we are um, looking at a positive certification, which means we're certifying that our finances are good, we're good, we're a going concern for this uh, budget year and then two, year, two, year budget, uh, two years out. And with that, uh, any questions, uh, be happy to take any. Trustee Murphy. Um, well, thank you, Jeff, for making that so interesting and exciting. I appreciate that. Um, my question is, you didn't really say with the 8.7 positive in 24-25, how did that, how do we get from in 23-24 negative, you know, 200,000, then positive 8.7, and then negative 5.9? Yeah, it's a great question. It's because we have all this one-time money that we have to spend by 2526. And so um, all of that is loaded, right? We're, you know, you have so many years to spend the money. And so we're spending that money as quickly as we can. And, and we, you know, you, you take all that one-time money and you start programs, right? That, uh, that you use with that one-time money. And then that one-time money goes away, right? And so then that's what produces that $5.9 million uh, change in the general fund. So is the, the idea that you're going to look at sustainability on the programs, how you can sustainably fund them through so that's what sources? We're gonna, yeah, exactly. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be picking up millions of pennies on thousands of budget lines, sharpening our pencil, a 2% savings, which we're going to come up with, and, and we can do that. You know, uh, again, on, on your size of a budget, half a billion dollar budget, 5.9 million is not a whole lot. However, it's still we got to but care. It's a of it, lot, right? And and I'm confident we can we can save we can find two percent outside the classroom. We can do it. But then Jeff, sorry, I keep going. Um, but then to me that doesn't take into account the pension costs going up at that level, at the okay. level they're predicted to go up. That 5.9, all the pension costs are baked into that 5.9. Mm. But then the year after that, because you have the pension costs still going up. Yep, that's all baked into the 5.9. That's that's. We, so if you're saying you're saying if we cut 5.9 in two years, we'll be safe yes. forever. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> we're we're right side. We're bringing. I say we're we're bringing the profile. Shark is laughing at me. <laughs> we're bringing the profile where it needs to be. Because she knows I don't mean forever, but I mean, <laughs> but you're thinking that that would, should do it. Yep. Yes. Okay. Knowing also <laughs> that California goes like this and then it goes like that. For what we know now. And then it goes like this right. and then it goes like that. And, and we're, we're uh, we baked into all of our assumptions that revenue trough. So yeah, if, if Cali uh, California goes off the deep end, we may have to come back to you with a different plan. But we, we, we have uh, our financial activators and, and we'll activate different plans if we need to. So this means we're going, we're going to stay with like the cheap supplies. Uh, those, uh, those, those pencil boxes. <laughs> you're going to make us stick with the cheap pencil boxes, aren't you, Jeff? We'll, we'll work on that. Perhaps a different 
Thank you, Jeff. That was really helpful. Trustee yeah. Wigan. Dr. Crane. Oh, Crane was first, if you want to. Oh, Trustee Crane. Yeah, um, so slide number six. The one that says state 2023-24 budget highlights uh, COLA was, you said is 8.22. Um, I kept on hearing 8.13, so did he, did the governor change that? Because we, we kept on reading that mag magic number of 8.13 percent. Yeah. Was that adjusted? That was adjusted. Recently? Mm-hmm. Like, just like recently. yesterday sort of thing? Or because mm -hmm. it was yesterday? <laughs> Uh, not yesterday. It, it came out a little bit before then. Okay. But uh, so yeah. that's a good thing. It is a good thing. Okay. Yeah. Positive. Nice. Next um, slide number eleven, the one that says um, that's titled NMUSD revenue peak in 2022-23. Um, can you speak to the inflationary forces that are in play, especially since um, we're now hearing that inflation instead of being at 9% is now cut in half. So how does that affect our, your, your outlook? Does it make it a little more rosy or not? So... Because uh, the cost we, of goods is going to cost less. Yeah, and, and we baked in inflation in all of our um, uh, estimates. And so uh, uh, where, where inflation is really getting, uh, I say, is hurting us is in facilities. Right. The cost um, of good. The construction yeah. is just, I mean, exploded. So this so. is going to help a bit. I hope so. Uh, Depends what the market, the industry yeah. does, I guess. But yeah, we're hoping them. we get some relief on the construction facility side. Mm. All right. And can you explain what you meant by two percent savings? Savings in that was the last your last slide. So the, the so savings meaning where we're going to get that. Or yeah, I I, forget, I did couldn't understand the context of that statement. So so we know that we we got to find roughly two percent in our budget to to, to cut to save essentially okay. yeah like so some sort of budget. You so, don't want to say the word but. Yeah, so, so there's a, a number of ways of doing that. When you think about it, you know, like 2% across the board, um, but we know that that's really not, you know, practice how that's going to happen. But we're going to be looking at, you know, when, when you have a budget of, of over 10,000 lines, right, and, and folks are entering what they think, we're going to be really looking hard at those numbers because what, uh, what you see a lot of times we... We budget, and then at the end of the year, we have excess, right? And that's from all those 10,000, over 10,000 lines of people, you know, guessing maybe it's, you know, it's $20 off this line, $100 off that line. So we're really going to shrink that down so that we're much more accurate, sharpening the pencil so we can kind of, I say, take out that uh, uh, slack in the system. So... Uh, in, in Newport Mesa, do we do this by department? By how, or is it, how, what does that look like? So you, uh, that looks like uh, across the entire system. So um, department, division, uh, you name it. Um, it's going to, we're looking across the entire uh, spectrum. Thank you. Trustee Wigand. So I think you kind of answered uh, my question with um, Trustee Crane's question, but so on all these activators, do you have a plan for once you trigger that activator or does it just say, hey, if we're in negative 5.9, that's a 2% drop across the board, not, hey, um, we, got, we got to run our secret play of cutting things in this budget right over here, that kind of thing, you know, it's more of across the board trigger based on the percentage and dollar value decreasing, correct? So, you know, that's interesting. That's a great, great question. So we know that the target's 2%. Mm -hmm. How we get there is going to be, is going to, uh, you, you know, uh, look differently in kind of each spectrum of the district, right? We're going to be things, you know, some, some groups may be able to say, oh, you know, I can figure out to a way to save 
right? Mm -hmm. Other groups may you know say, oh, you know, I I got one percent for you. I can't. You know, I can't. Yeah. You know what I mean? But the target, the overall target, is two percent, mm -hmm. and and that's where we're going to go. And uh, the um, uh, a lot of it is is going to be you know wringing out that excess in the system. And, and getting more precise yep. on our budgeting forecasting. So you don't have um, play one, two, and three, and where you expect to have the cuts and all that kind of stuff. No, Not set. Yeah. Just go into, hey, transportation, where can you cut 2%? Where can you cut Exactly. 2%? Got it. Yeah, we're going to be working with folks, getting feedback from them on how we can make that work. And the great news is we've got two years to do it. Yep. So we got time. Awesome. Thank you. Dr. Smith. <laughs> Yeah, just uh, understanding your question, and, and I think that's the right way to think about it. There are certainly some activators that are more dire than others. Mm. So, so Jeff, when he looks at some of these things, he's going to be saying that's one that is falling off the cliff kind of thing, not a budget trough, mm. right? So the idea is to deal with those first activators and say, how do we address that shortfall so we don't get to that, that other spot? But he has multiple which is a great way to, to go about it. And it, so he's, he's describing, you know, um, to just make sure that we sharpen the pencil, right? It, it's almost like a mindset activity. Mm -hmm. We're not having to do things necessarily differently, right? But if some of those more serious activators were hit, if the returns don't come in like uh, Trustee Bartow and Trustee Murphy were saying, um, then we might have to do other things. But, but that's, that's why he put that together was to really be calculated, not wait till the moment that it's necessary yeah. to do those things. Mm -hmm. But certainly there are some more significant than others. And then, um, Trustee Crane, I would just say, I think it was in the governor's May revise that he changed the COLA from 8.13 to 8.22. Okay. So that's when he did it during the revise. And what we've seen, I think it's interesting, and we'll see where this lands, and that's what you reported on, Trustee Murphy, is the governor's been saying, no, 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 this is where it is, this is where yeah. it is. Yeah. The LAO and the legislature said, no, it's not. It's lower than that and all these things. And so where, they, where they've conceded is basically they're saying their expectations now for returns are the same as the governor's. And they haven't been saying that. And the LAO hasn't been saying that. So instead of they were fighting for a cut the rainy day or draw from the rainy day, rather, you know, do this, cut the cola, deficit the cola. Now they're saying, no, okay, we believe you because we're going to have all this money coming in. Uh, let's sign the budget. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed, yeah. Superintendent. Trustee Crane. I have one last question. Apologies, I know it's getting late. But I, since we, we do um, get our 70%, 76% of our revenue is from our local property taxes, um, has there been a change in the projection of our assessed values since the last, uh, since the May revise to now or? the last time you reported us? So for 22-23, we experienced a 9% uh, growth, year-over-year -year growth in, in property taxes. That, ain't, that will, will not happen again. And so for the, the next year, this 23-24 year, we're looking at a 5% growth 5%. rate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I have a question about on the on that slide on the financial activator slide, because um, it looks like for the past two years and then going in the future for the um, the the GF REU that we are at four point five percent. Uh huh. Um, for all of those, is but favorable is greater than four point five, and I was just wondering. I was trying to find. Um, what it was maybe in like 2018. Is there a reason why we're not doing something that's a little bit higher for the reserve? So this is the general fund reserve for economic uncertainties. The state requires us to have, requires us to have a 3% reserve. The board gave us direction to go to four and a half some years ago, and it's been four and a half ever since then. Um, you also have in the general fund a cash flow reserve which uh, uh, protects us so that we don't have to borrow and go to the money changers and spend a lot of money to borrow money. And so you have sufficient reserves um, to, um, uh, to weather any kind of uh, 
economic issue that we could have. So four and a half uh, is a sufficient number. Okay, but um, since, I mean, I'm not one, just because we've been doing it for a long time means we need to keep doing it. Do you recommend that we perhaps up that, considering that things are relatively volatile at times, or property tax can do different funky things at times? Does it make sense for us to up that in even like 2000, 2026 when things are changing to go up to 5% for the reserve? Um, I don't think you need to okay. do that. Because it says favorable greater than 4.5, so I'm like, yeah. I want us to be in favorable. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good green. point. You know, favorable, maybe we should change that. Um, acceptable, it really is... Is, uh, is really a good thing. Um, but you're right, maybe favorable is always always better um, hmm. in my eyes. I, certainly I could, you know, I would love to have more than 4.5%, but given the things that, that we need to do in terms of helping our students, um, that would be taking money off the table. Um, and, and I don't think you need yeah. to do that, given the reserves that you have with the cash flow and reserves in Fund 17. But to be clear, I mean, this is your budget. So next year, maybe as we do our budget study session, which we did for the first time this year as a workshop, that could be the goal uh, as Jeff prepares the budget for next year, if you wanted to increase that. So. Thank you. Um, and then, let me see. I have a little indents over here. I should have notated these in a better way. Um, one of the things that I was looking at, um, it re related to the sharpening pencil piece, but um, we have a couple of large departments that have, and I think one of them had like $500,000 budgeted for overtime. And to me, that's something that it makes sense we would maybe reallocate or think through if there's a couple of departments that have really high amounts, do we need more employees? Or is that, like, to me, it seems odd to have budgeted so much money for overtime in some of our departments. And then one of the other things that I looked at that I think in the past few years, because we had a lot of the one-time money, it seemed like there are really, really high amounts for some software programs and some of the licensing fees. So to me, those are two areas that it makes sense to look at, again, now that we don't have copious one-time funds, um, because there's some of the software programs were hundreds of thousands of dollars, and some departments have like six of them. So um, just kind of thinking through as we are with, you know, we're going to use Lexi, or we're gonna use some like more common software across the district for schools. I think perhaps per cutting back on a a couple of those, not all of those, but I mean, just kind of looking through those, I think could be helpful. Those are, those are some of the big ones and I was surprised looking through those. That's about it, thank you. I have a couple more, but I'll have a private chat with you another day when we have a long time to chat, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Trader. Um, and next we have Oh, yes, I'll close, okay. We're closing the hearing at 8.43, and we are moving on to item 22C, the public hearing for SELPA, the local plan services plan and the SELPA annual budget plan for the 2023-2024 school year. At 8.44, the public hearing is now open, and there are no comment cards. But do we have a, a we have a report? Nope. The re there's a report in the budget. Or the, there's a report in the agenda. It's just for our review? Okay. All right. Okay. I, it would be nice, I think, at some point to have it be publicly presented. I think it's important information. One of the things that I was noticing was just how much we're funding. I mean, like $79 million. So... Okay, next will be 23, discussion action calendar. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, close. 
closing, closing it out at 8:44. Um, okay. Discussion action calendar 23A: Approve addition to high school and middle school course of study. Ms. Torres. Yes, before you this evening, you have a series of courses um, that are coming forward for a myriad of different reasons. Um, you'll see elective courses for middle school. You'll see additional courses for Monta Vista, our independent study program, and our transition to cloud, um, as well as some other courses of study for foreign language this evening. Okay, thank you. Do I have a motion or any questions? So moved. Okay. So moved by Trustee Crane. I second. Second by Trustee Pearson. Roll call vote. Student Board Member Marcy Cope. Yes. Trustee Anderson. Yes. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Wigand. Yes. Trustee Pearson. Yes. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Ursoilu. Trustee Barto. Yes. Next is 23B, adopt resolution 260623 to apply for the second application to California Schools Healthy Air, Plumbing and Efficiency Program, CalShape grant for additional schools. Mr. Trader. And this is a grant that will uh, provide us for uh, HVAC uh, maintenance and filter replacement and uh, CO2 monitors for the classrooms. And it's about $3 million. $36,000. Great. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Do you want to say so moved? Do you want to move oh. the motion? So yeah. moved. Okay. Second. Okay. Moved by Marcy Cope. Seconded by Trustee Crane. Roll call vote. Um, sorry, point of order. Mm -hmm. uh, student board members have a non-preferential voting, so we do need to have a regular. We need to have a regular board uh, member make the motion. Oh, well, I was hoping oh. that you can get some. You know, sorry. you're you're all good. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. Okay, all right. So I can I can move the mo I can move it. So so moved. I can be the one who. <laughs> you're okay. well, you're putting the motion the on the floor. Okay. Who? I'll second. Okay. <laughs> Okay, roll call vote. Student board member Marcy Cope. Yes. Trustee Anderson. Mm -hmm. Yes. Trustee Crane. Yes. Trustee Wigand. Yes. Trustee Pearson. Yes. Trustee Murphy. Yes. Trustee Ursoilu. Trustee Barto. Yes. Okay, next is 23C, the first reading and adoption of modifications to board policy. Mr. Smith, Dr. Smith. We had um, Jeff Trader, Kerry Torres lead the board through that exercise, the board front of you, they can speak to any of the items the board recommended, as could the trustees and the edit committee. Trustee uh, Murphy, did you have a comment about the policies? It's trustee, it's all mixed up, it's me. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yes. Um, for policy 5131, uh, regarding attire, for it's the conduct policy. Mm -hmm. um, it was changed from inappropriate attire to consistent with dress code, which I think is a great step in the right direction. Um, but we don't have a consistent dress code policy across the district. Um, so do we have a plan to address that? Or otherwise, I would suggest that maybe inappropriate attire is to be left in for now. I, I don't know. I just If we're going to uh, say in our policy consistent with dress code, but our school policies are not consistent. It feels like a, asking a lot for a student. Yes, that is exactly what our policy committee also commented. Um, what page is I, that? We, we brought it forward for a first reading so people could make comments on it, but we agree there needs to be a second reading. And also, if anyone has any adjustments or anything they would like changed or updated, that would be great. Yeah, my comment would be that we would move to a second reading, right? before we passed for, and adopted. For 5-1, policy 5131. Mm -hmm. And Trustee Crane, it's the bottom of page two on 5131. Found it. Thank you. Did anyone have any comments on any of the other policies? Um, I, I have a couple questions just on the, um, the students in elementary school using cell phones, smartwatches, or smart smartphones, that kind of thing. Um, on well, it's on a couple of pages actually. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, of things written about it. It's on okay. policy, on a 
5131 on page four, and then I think it's all on 5131.8 mobile device or mobile communications device. Um, so I see it in a lot of different places, I guess. Uh, question, does, is it supposed to be in a bunch of different places? I, I you know, and I'm probably it is, but a uh, question on the smart watches, um, when they're, they're tracking devices, like, you know, they can only make a call out like the gizmo or those types of things, those have to be turned off and then in their backpacks, um, or are they left at, I mean, so they're only supposed to be in the backpacks. So I know there's a lot of kids that do have those gizmo watches because they walk home or whatever in their families. So I just want to make sure that that might be a little bit clearer on where it's supposed to go, what happens if they're in violation, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so um, we one of the conversations that we were talking about is all of these are on campus and at the direction or instruction of their teacher. So there are some places where, you know, if a teacher asks, student you know students to use their phones, phones for a quiz yeah. or you mm -hmm. know there's there's some of those things that happen um but so if someone was walking home that's not on campus that you know people are allowed to use them any way that they would want um and the the main piece for some of it too is is the privacy rights of others that are around them mm -hmm. um but yeah so on five one three one eight yeah if you would like if there's any edits that you would like to remove, or if any of that seems redundant. We, there's the cell phone policy and then also the conduct policy mm -hmm. that they both talk about the mobile devices. Okay. So the language is common, but they're two separate policies. Separate policy. They just hadn't, um, the mobile devices hadn't been updated since 2019, and mm. the conduct hadn't been for since 2016. Okay. So they weren't aligned necessarily. Okay. I mean, I think I, it's it's all great because we definitely need to update these policies. And I know that obviously cell phones are quite quite an issue, but I do know that smartwatches have been um, quite an issue to you know principals sending out notifications like please let your kid not have to have this you know on or put it in its backpack or whatever because it's it's interrupting mm -hmm. their day. You know they're just mm -hmm. you know looking at it uh, on yeah. um, in the classroom. So. Did we get any um, feedback on this from principals or anyone else that would have any comments on that? Not sure if we can, um, but I just wanna make sure that it, it's something that they can enforce. So we do talk to the principals about enforceability of any type of tech devices. Um, in particular, we didn't necessarily ask about watches, mm -hmm. um, but principals are asking for some level of consistency in a policy to be able to address it. Um, one of you commented right now just on enforceability as well. You know, how do we hold kids accountable for that? Um, and really is about best practice. So we're not trying to be punitive with these policies. It really is about trying to maintain the instructional environment and keeping kids focused and away from technology in those spaces. When you think about um, students, um, you know, entering campus or after school, things like that, that's a whole different ball game and kids have a lot more flexibilities there. Um, but principals are looking for ways to be able to talk with parents about monitoring their use of technology during the school day. So the intent of these policies are to do just that, to provide a best practice. We never really, and most of our policies don't really hardline either way. You know, when we talk about accountability with students, it gives us a best practice to be able to talk with teachers and talk with students and families. And to um, President Anderson's point, um, there is a whole policy now on <coughs> mobile communication devices that didn't exist before. That's really important because yeah. students sometimes get in trouble specifically mm -hmm. for the use of a mobile or technology device where the conduct policy includes everything under the sun, right? Mm -hmm. That you read, it's enumerated, there's lots of things in there. And technology happens to be a portion of that. Yeah. Um, so that's why there is a little okay. bit of redundancy. Got it. Um, in terms of smartwatches, the ask from, from leadership has really been to have them out of sight and turned off, right? So vibrate silent mode or out of sight. Okay. Um, so that's been the ask. Okay. Because so I just want to make sure, so I'm just thinking of, you know, issues that might arise with it is that, you know, one parent has a, has a kid that's at, you know, elementary school, one's in middle school, one's in whatever, and there's different policies, and they say, well, they're allowed at this school, they're not allowed at that school, and just so we have consistent, and then, you know, parents talk across the board, like, well, my principal doesn't allow, you know, says I can do that and that, so just trying, and I love a good clear policy like this, just, I'm just thinking of, you know, 
things that could happen or, or emails we will get. Mm -hmm. um, Consistency is a, a goal yeah. of ours. Um, you know, we're not going to have exact practice at every single school, but being more consistent helps us be better and helps, yeah. uh, you know, create clarity for parents. Um, this will allow, um, these policies will allow principals in their opening letters or newsletters or communications to mm -hmm. families just as reminders. These are the things that we'd like to see on our campus yeah. and these are our policies. Okay. So would That's that good. generate communication for you? Maybe. Um, but I think really in some spaces, it's really just going to tighten up our current practices. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I, I like this. Any kind of more policies as opposed to our loose one, that was, is great. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we wanted to, to have it. So, I mean, if you're at one high school and you, exactly. it doesn't make sense that there's so much variance currently. Right. Okay. So it sounds like possibly we'll bring back five one three one for a second reading at our next meeting next week do you have anyone have any questions about policy three three one one or three three one one dot one or would you like to bring all of them back for a second reading at the next meeting I don't have issues I, I'm I'm good with uh, the first two three three okay. one one and three one one but, point one yeah the, bid, the bids and construction, okay. yeah, those should be fine. So do you like to make a motion to approve those on the first reading and then? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So I move to adopt policy 51318.8, um, policy 3311, and policy 3311.1 on first reading. Okay. Do you have a second? We're going to move to adopt them all? No, all except. Oh, except I didn't one. say. So 5131.8. Okay. Right, but not 5131. Got it. Okay. Because of the, that's the yes, dress code yes, policy. Yes, yes, code yeah. Sorry. Second. Um, Sorry. Okay. Moved by Trustee Barto, seconded by Trustee Murphy. Roll call vote. Student Board Member Marcy Cope? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Wigan? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Trustee Barto? Yes. Cool. Did you get that for the next meeting? 5131 for a second meeting. Okay. Thank you. Great. All right. Next, we have informal reports. Dr. Smith? Oh, we need to do uh, the motion for 5131 as a second reading. Oh, yeah. For a second reading? Yeah. Okay. Um, I move that we. Uh, have a second reading for policy 5131 conduct. A second. Okay. Moved by Trustee Crane, seconded by Trustee Pearson. Roll call vote. Student Board Member Marcy Cope? Yes. Trustee Anderson? Yes. Trustee Crane? Yes. Trustee Pe Weigand? Yes. Trustee Pearson? Yes. Trustee Murphy? Yes. Trustee Ursoilu? Trustee Barto? Yes. I'm unusually tired for 8.50. It's very unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? so, All right. We long now we are ready. Yes. Yeah. All right. Now we're ready for formal like reports. Yeah, I appreciate something that uh, Stu said earlier. You know, this time of the year, there's some great things that happen, but there are also some tough decisions that have to be made, tough conversations. And I think Stu said, uh, we can do anything when we do it together. And I just want to thank our labor partners for working together to do some of this tough work. Uh, at the end of the year that uh, puts us in a position to, to start the year strong next year. So again, thank you for your continued support. Uh, I wanted to focus on how great last week was. The graduations, they were amazing, they were inspiring. The speeches, the performances, um, yeah, inspiring. But I also wanted to share some data. Uh, this year we crunched some numbers at Back Bay High School, 91.9, let's call it 92% of the students graduated. At Harbor, 98% graduated. At Estancia, 95.9 or 96%. Um, at CDM, 99.8%, almost 100. Uh, Costa Mesa High School, 97.8%. Wow. Uh, early College High School, 100%. Cloud, 100%, Monte Vista, 100%. Across the district, 98% of the students that started the school year with us 
graduated. And I just want to say a huge thank you to the board that's prioritized graduating students who are college and career ready. It starts with graduation, right? To realize your college and career dreams. Thank you to the board for setting that goal, to the staff that do the work, certainly the district office staff, the teachers in every classroom, the support staff supporting the instruction, but also supporting making sure that the, the learning environment is clean and it's safe. They're feeding kids, they're driving kids to school, they're answering calls in the front office or meeting parents who may not be the happiest that morning. It all counts and so to all the employees um, out there uh, at the end of this school year I cannot thank you enough for everything you've done to make sure that this year alone 98 percent of our students graduated so thank you all right who would like to begin tonight Oh, I think we're all going to start. Oh, Josh, you might get it. Okay, so I want to also say the graduations were amazing. I went to early college high school, Costa Mesa High School in, and Newport Harbor, um, as well as numerous awards uh, ceremonies. And it's just amazing how smart our, our kids are um, and just at what they're achieving and the amount of of uh, awards that they've received and the medals that they have at graduation. But, but what was really inspiring was the, the student speakers. And they were just, their, their amazing um, outlook on life um, and their, I guess, maturity at this point and just what they're gonna go off and achieve. I, I'm just, I'm really impressed and it's a very um, heartwarming, it's a very heartwarming time, I should say. Um, and to Carol Crane's point, at one point you said it was the ch chicken soup for our soul um, graduation mm -hmm. is, and yep. it definitely is that. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I attended um, this past week, uh, I attended the Newport Beach liaison meeting um, where we met with the city manager and um, two um, city council members police department, um, their, their public works director, and as well as their um, activities folks. Um, and we discussed, I know, uh, you know, about their public library system and our use of it at the Mariners facility. And, you know, we came to uh, not a conclusion, but a conclusion that we need to, to figure out a way to be able to utilize that library um, for Mariners with the um, qualities that we expect in a library here at, at Newport Mesa. Um, I believe that, that that library is is so amazing for the students at Mariners to be able to use. Um, we need to make sure that we have um, uh, an MOU with the city that allows us to utilize that library in the context of the type of, of uh, material that we believe um, is, is age appropriate. Um, and and we we're, we're obviously just want to use that books and provide our, our students um, any way that we can utilize that library and, and work together on that. So we're working together. We've spoken with the city manager. We've spoken with numerous people um, about, about being able to, to utilize that, that, that library and creating an, an MOU. Um, and so hopefully we will get that done um, quite quickly so that we can put all this behind us and we know that we prioritize education and safety of our students first. And we also talked about bike safety, and that was that was great as well. And hopefully, we'll have more. We'll have some bike rodeos on the elementary side, or sorry, on the Newport Beach side, just like you guys did at Estancia. So, yeah, wonderful. Sure, Trustee Crane, you can go next. Okay. So, um, Dr. Smith, I wanted to to give a little perspective on Back Bay, really. Uh, Dr. Baumeister gave us a statistic that was absolutely amazing. He said that this year, 92% graduated as opposed to last year at 70%. That now is a statistic that makes uh, us so excited. So let's keep it up. Back <laughs> um, All right, so again, graduation, amazing. It is chicken soup for, uh, for the soul. Uh, I attended Cappy's, the Cappy Gala for uh, for our, you know, for the county, and it was quite amazing that uh, Corona Del Mar High School Theater won 10 out of the 21 nominations. Um, I think it was a record for for the school. 
I wanted to, I heard a lot from the community, the CDM community, regarding bringing back graduation to Corona Del Mar High School, our home field. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Smith, Dr. Torres, and also uh, uh, Principal Haley and everyone else that was involved in allowing it to, to come back to our home, um, our home uh, turf. And the community was very grateful. I did want to recognize uh, the East Bluff Elementary principal that is retiring, Cheryl Beck. Um, she had an amazing uh, run at Newport Mesa, a loyal, loyal employee that loved kids and did a lot to our community. So Cheryl, thank you for your service. And go ahead and enjoy retirement being a grandma. <laughs> Uh, we do have a CABS meeting that is coming up on Thursday. We, the, the, big, the objective of CABS, this CABS meeting is what is fall going to look like when it comes to safe routes to school, bikes, walk, and all the above. So you, we're looking forward to that. Do you want to say what the acronym is? Hmm? Do you want to tell the public what the acronym is? Oh, uh, CABS stands for Community Alliance for Bike Safety. <laughs> And that's it. Uh, congratulations, class of 2023. <laughs> we have two in the room right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who would like to go next? I'll go next. Um, again, like everybody else, the award ceremonies and the graduations were just very inspiring for us to be there. It's what we work all year for. It's what our staff, what um, our teachers, our administrators, um, our parents, just amazing. Um, I think what not only was inspiring, um, but I, the confidence that these kids had, the student speakers. Um, I got to attend three of my elementary school's graduations, and I mean that was also that was just in light of all the the other stuff. They were they were amazing to see those sixth graders get up there and speak with the confidence that they had. Um, it was so much fun, and to see. The tradition also that our, some of our schools have where the graduating seniors come back and speak to our elementary schools was probably one of my favorite things to attend um, and to hear where all these kids are going. And I mean, if, if anybody is rooting on or in, encouraging our students to stay at Newport Mesa Unified School Districts, it's our seniors, um, to hear them talking. We couldn't do as good of a job as what they do. Um, and I think every Every elementary school, K through six or K through fifth, um, were were encouraged and wanted to be at, be in our schools, be at Newport Mesa Unified School District. So it, that was my favorite part of the end of the season. Thank you, Trustee Murphy. Um, yes, uh, same about graduation. Uh, that was fun. Um, Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to give my first graduation speech. <laughs> uh, haven't haven't been out on the graduation field in quite a while, so um, you so, were excellent. You did an excellent oh, job. Thank you. I had a lot of help. Um, it was uh, yes, amazing. So many Costa Mesa um, high school seniors were just covered in awards. I've never seen anything like that. They were jingling and jangling with all their medals, and they. Um, it was it was amazing. The work that is done at Costa Mesa is fantastic. It's just it's through the roof. So uh, that was really great to see. Um, the middle school um, we promoted uh, that group to high school. That was also lots of fun. Great group of kids there. Um, two two sad notes at Costa Mesa High School. Uh, we did have to say goodbye to our music teacher, music mm. director Sandy Gilbo, mm. after 32 years of service. Um, she's beloved by the students at Costa Mesa. Um, she is just like an institution <laughs> over there, so it'll, it'll be very hard to fill her shoes. So Sandy, we really thank you for all your years of service, for teaching those kids a love of music that they'll have for the rest of their lives. Um, some of them have gone on to have, have careers in music, so um, she is phenomenal, thank you. Um, also, Sharon Ewell, the athletic director, 25 years at Costa Mesa. She also is an institution <laughs> beloved by the students, so amazing. 
amazing um, at the Costa Mesa uh, United Sports Youth Meeting. Um, I forget all the acronyms <laughs> in that. Um, but every single coach in Costa Mesa from every sport, from every activity, thanked her for everything that she has done for the students and for the teams and for um, her excellent leadership and, and sportsmanship over all these years. So um, both of them seemed not sure exactly what they were going to do, but it was going to be more more fun, I think, than, than uh, getting up every day. So uh, I hope they are enjoying their vacations and their retirement. Um, also just wanted to say quickly thank you to Dr. Kwong for his years of service, first couple of years of service over at Costa Mesa Middle School. Um, he is go going on to CDM. Um, we will miss him over at Costa Mesa. One of the nicest things that uh, was said to me was from um, my son's aide who texted me at the end of the year uh, about how much better um, she felt about uh, Costa Mesa Middle School, how much work he had put into really helping the kids coming out of COVID with all of uh, they were dealing with and that she really appreciated all of his hard work. So um, CDM, you are in great hands. You are going to love Dr. Kwong. Um, and certainly Dr. Granger over at Kaiser, um, she is an amazing principal. Um, everyone was sad to see her go. I know she's going to enjoy this next year. Um, but Dr. Granger, if you're watching, um, the parents, uh, teachers, students all really love you and thank you for all your years of service at Kaiser. So thank you very much. And um, I think that's it. Thank you. Um, just quickly touching on the books, I'm just really appreciative of the robust process that our district has did develop. We learned a lot um, and we worked with parents and staff and um, I'm excited to share that process and everything we have learned uh, with our public libraries. Um, I, fun fact, I worked at the Newport Beach Public Library when I was in high school, and the <laughs> library director and I worked together at that time. So um, it would be a good time to catch up. Um, additionally, uh, I attended the TK promotion uh, at Newport L, which was so fun. Um, I forgot how little they are. Um, and I also had two promotions of my own, one of my kids from sixth grade and one from Ensign. So that was a really memorable moment for our family. Um, I also was really uh, thrilled to participate in the Cloud Campus Middle and Cloud Campus High School um, graduations, um, especially since it's their last year, They, the staff went above and beyond to make it special for them. They said over and over how they just wanted it to be like a really special, special ceremony. And I feel like they they achieved that. It was uh, beautiful and uh, meaningful. And um, so many of the students had uh, their lives touched by these um, members of their staff, even though it was virtual. So that was, that was really, really cool to be a part of. Um, one thing that we did back before all that, which we probably don't even remember because it seems like so long ago, but the classified job shadow day um, was was a really great thing that we participated in. Um, I was fortunate enough to work with the IT department, which was um, great and very timely for me because I had just been uh, with a bunch of CSBA delegates and we had been, the, one of the big topics was cybersecurity and um, so many districts shared their uh, the, horror stories, the things that they had been through. And I um, wondered how we'd been so fortunate to avoid so many of these horror stories. Well, it wasn't luck and it wasn't an accident. We have a really <laughs> wonderful group back there who um, are forward thinking. And um, if you know anything about uh, computers, they have, they're not only forward thinking, but they're also redundant. They have so many backup systems in so many ways. So, um, you know, they, there's, there's a million things that could go wrong and they're on, 24-7 watch and just really being creative as how to, how to stay on top of that. So very appreciative that we um, have to this point been, um, th their hard work has not gone unnoticed, even though before it was unnoticed. Now I'd like to recognize their hard work. Um, and then let's see, um, just wanted to thank, thank the board again for the policy committee. Um, we, we did talk a little bit about here about parents' rights, but I wanted to just clarify Parents have a right to transparency and access, and we have done such a great job of in our district, I think, of working hard for that for a lot of years and engagement. Um, so I know we're hoping to clarify just what we've already been doing and um, what we 
um, continue to do and allowing parents to, uh, as you can see, we have this community engagement in the LCAP and I'm so impressed with in the past two years how we've improved that and how we've involved students and parents. Those focus groups blew me away and really reminded me of how um, thoughtfully we approach everything we do at Newport Mesa. And that's it. Great, yes, I love to see that there were so many student focus groups. I thought that was really lovely. Um, I got to attend the Whittier Dual Immersion Celebration, and one of the highlights for me was seeing the students who are at Ensign that have come from that program. I thought that was just a great idea to have them come um, and share what they, kind of some of the highlights and have one of their teachers come. So there was a direct connection for the sixth grade students to feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, so that was a huge milestone. And I just wanted to thank a lot of our staff um, in the facilities department who have been working tirelessly with our city partners. Um, I'm excited about what's to come with opening up some of our playgrounds for park use after school and on the weekends. And I'm particularly happy that um, our staff saw the need for additional parking for the Estancia graduation and had already started working on that. And I think there were, there were no hitch, I mean, there were no backup. There were no backed up cars. It was like nice. a lovely open space on Placentia. <laughs> and I, that's the best graduation I've ever seen. So um, thank you for all of the work around that. And um, I got to attend a lot of the T. Winkle and Estancia um, events, award ceremonies, promotions. Um, for me, it was a huge highlight to be able to do the graduation speech at Estancia. My area doesn't represent any high school or secondary schools, and so I never would have thought that the school that I went to for three years that I would be up there speaking. And so it was really a lovely and amazing experience for me. Um, and then also I got to attend um, the community, the um, community, what is it, the cafes, the community oh. and engagement kind of conversations that are happening um, from Love Costa Mesa at Back Bay and Early College. So really um, expanding upon those community partnerships and hearing from the principals what the top needs are at each of those schools and how the nonprofits and community partners can all come together and work on shared goals um, and really some specific measurable things that have made an incredible difference um, already to, to some of the students. Um, and I got to shadow, I think, I think it was Kristen maybe that set up our classified appointments. I think that like every single one of us had really great people that we got partnered with. And I got to shadow um, Fabi who's a, a facilitator at Newport Harbor and it was a very busy day and I got to see a lot um, and it was just really delightful. Um, and lastly, I'm really excited about our new student board members that will be coming to our next board meeting. I'm introducing them to um, our community. A few of them have already been doing some of their own advocacy work and so it's really cool I think as we continue to expand um, upon what we've started. It's just great to have the voices and the experience and the direct feedback. So that is all from me. I will adjourn the meeting at 918.